Ah, Donald Trump. So Carpenter was already getting his name above the title before he even had one hit. This would be the equivalent of M. Night Shyamalan's Sixth Sense. Exactly 22 days before the Kennedy assassination. Coincidence? Jesus, could this house look more uninviting to trick-or-treaters? The Myers couldn't even bother to put the jack-o'-lantern on the steps so people could see it better from the street. This family can't do pumpkin placement correctly. We are alone, aren't we? Michael's around someplace. Michael's older sister decides, ah, I can have sex with my boyfriend with Michael around. It's not like he'll turn into a psycho killer if he sees this douchebag pounding me. I gotta go. Will you call me tomorrow? So from the time the lights went out in Judith's bedroom to now, it's been one minute and eight seconds. And a good 20 seconds of that is getting clothes off. I know this kid's in high school, but man, that is literally some weak sauce and not very long lasting. Also, after the terrible sex performance, Michael's gonna kill his sister? Michael starts stabbing his sister and then he turns to his right and what? Is he stabbing the air now? Michael? This is a great reveal and what a fun unbroken shot to start off a cheap horror movie. I'm removing three sins for this. Also, the Myers mask is iconic, but can we all just admit an adult in this clown costume would have been equally creepy? Well, Dave, we just found our son standing here with a bloody butcher knife in his hand, but let's just stand and stare. Don't you think we could refer to it as him? If you say so. The compassion's overwhelming, Doctor. Really, Marion? Just a minute ago you were complaining about their gibberish. I think the expression is, don't throw stones at crazy people's houses, or something along those lines. Man, it'd be weird if this simple shot of a matchbook inspired a white trash-themed reboot of this series almost 30 years later. Thank God that never happens. I don't care if he's from hell or not. This guy doesn't have the strength to open palm shatter a car window like that. He's gone. He's gone from here. The evil is gone. You see, Dr. Loomis, this is why nobody takes you seriously. You talk about Michael Myers in dramatic horror movie terms. You know the truth, so you've taken a leap nobody else is ready to accept. You need to learn how to relay how evil he is without calling him the evil. Also, how did you know that was Michael? All you saw was one of the many patients driving away in the car, but you never saw his face. Also, also, how the f*** does Michael know how to drive a car? He's been in this joint since he was six. Did they put him in the student driver program? Don't forget to drop the key off at the Myers place. I won't! They're coming by to look at the house at 10.30. This is a throwaway line, but brings up the question of what the f*** happens to the potential home buyers. In just two minutes, we will see Michael's already taken up residence. This is never mentioned again. And why wouldn't Mr. Strode be at the house to show it? Haddonfield, Illinois, where the California palms grow like wildflowers. I believe that's the city's motto. So, 15 years have gone by and nobody can sell the murder house? Why hasn't this place been condemned? Also, you'd think if you're Strode Realty, you'd get somebody to at least clean up the exterior a bit. And maybe do a little work inside, so you don't have to rely on Tom Hanks and Shelley Long to buy it. I told him how dangerous you he was. You couldn't have two roadblocks and an all-points bulletin wouldn't stop a five-year-old. But it should have. How does crazy-ass Michael Myers drive a stolen station wagon through two roadblocks without anyone seeing it? Does he somehow know secret Mario Kart paths to avoid cops? Because remember, this asshole's been in an institution for 15 years. And has the mind of a child. I don't care how the evil he is. He can't drive a car. He was doing very well last night. Maybe someone around here gave him lessons. Listen here, Dr. Loomis. I already seen that I know this sinning thing is a joke to you, but I take it goddamn seriously and so do certain Hollywood directors. Man, it'd be weird if Dr. Wynn, who's only in this one scene, would show up in, say, the sixth film in this franchise, and we'd find out he's a member of a weird cult that worships Michael Myers. Thank God that never happens. This is a great shot, and I'd remove a sin, except... How did Michael know Lori would be sitting next to a window for him to stalk so perfectly? So, why did he walk from Lori's school to this kid's school? Michael's business is killing babysitters. So, is this some sort of complex dive into the human soul? Where he sees a lot of himself in the kid and he feels the need to protect him? Now, I'd like that, but that shit ain't the truth. The truth is, you're the weak and I'm the tyranny of evil men. Wait, sorry guys. Let's go on to the next scene. No one will be seated during the Michael goes back to the car, starts it, and drives alongside Tommy portion of the movie. Also, if this is supposed to be from Michael's perspective, then why are we looking out the back window of the car while he's driving? Michael, like most asshole drivers on the road, doesn't bother to signal when he turns right. Yeah, Haddonfield seems like the type of culturally relevant town in Illinois where a sign telling you it's 73 miles away would be appropriate. Payphone! He is coming to Haddonfield because I know him. From what Loomis told us earlier, Michael hasn't spoken a word in 15 years since the murder. So what information did he give Loomis that made him so certain he'd go back there if he escaped? Dr. Loomis conveniently pulling up to the side of the road where the dead motorist, an abandoned truck, and a phone are is convenient. Also, how is this not a crime scene by now? No one saw an abandoned truck on the side of the road with the door wide open and thought to check that out in the last few hours? Loomis knows Michael was here because of the matchbook the nurse used to light her cigarette, but doesn't bother to check for dead bodies. That might have been a good thing to discover and tell the police earlier. He could even tell them that there's a sign pointing the way to Haddonfield from this new murder site. Tickets on sale for what? Just the high school in general? And who would even see the sign? It's practically in a forest. Hey, jerk! Speed kills! Michael is literally going drive-by stalking speed, barely faster than you assholes are walking. Also, there is no way that Michael could have heard anything Annie was saying while in a moving car at that distance. I hate a guy with a car and no sense of humor. That is very specific. It's almost like you're saying you'd like the guy if he didn't own a car, but still had no sense of humor. I've got three choices. 
watch the kids sleep, listen to Linda screw around, or talk to you. I'm starting to think Myers later kills Annie to put her out of her misery. Oh, look. Look where? Annie was clearly looking straight ahead when Michael was visible, so how did she not see him? For a movie that is so good at elevating tension and suspense with the use of atmosphere and music, jump scares like this come off even more annoying. You know, it's Halloween. I guess everyone's entitled to one good scare, huh? And a creepy adult who doesn't understand the concept of personal space. Trick or treat! Trick or treat! Trick or treating at three in the goddamn afternoon. Even if it's like five or six, you are severely limiting your candy haul. If she's been gone all day, why the f is this window open? So at this point, you call the cops, right? No? Okay, carry on. Rotary phone! Hello? This turns out to be Lori's friend Annie, who decided to call while her mouth was full of cereal and didn't even bother an attempt to say something. Judith Myers, Myers, row 18, clock 20. During his important search for Michael Myers, Dr. Loomis decides to check out the local cemetery to see if Michael defiled his sister's grave, which somehow takes precedence over checking his old neighborhood first. Why do they do it? Goddamn kids. Steal tombstones? That's a common occurrence in Haddonfield or anywhere. Mr. Riddle was watching you? Lori, Mr. Riddle is 87. He can still watch. It's probably all he can do. I like to think this film encouraged a giant spike in 87-year-old men joining gyms in 1978. Lori, <coughs> stop coughing! What's the matter with you? Since they're smoking weed and don't want to get caught, why exactly couldn't they just skip talking to the sheriff? He's clearly busy, and he could have just driven right past him and he probably wouldn't have even noticed. All they took was some Halloween mask, a rope, and a couple of knives. They stole a Halloween mask at the hardware store? Also, what's the f***ing deal with this town? Michael's been able to walk around in daylight all day, drive around in a stolen station wagon that is very easy to identify. He stole a tombstone from a cemetery, committed a hardware store robbery, and between stops he stalked Lori throughout the movie. And nobody's seen this f***ing guy, except Lori. Also, also, Michael had the mask on when he was stalking Lori at school, and afterwards when the girls were walking home. So, has this alarm been going off all day? One thing this movie does in superb fashion, and it feels like nobody really ever tried this in horror movies afterwards, is using the edges of the frame to show Michael lurking around every corner. This movie constantly asks you to search the frame for it. A Where's Waldo for the 70s crowd. And it perfectly puts the viewer on edge. I guess we'll just chalk it up to the fact that Lori and Annie are high when they don't notice the same station wagon following them everywhere they go. Dog, it's still warm. He got hungry. Okay, this movie does not know how to time frame correctly. So Michael has presumably been following Lori around all day. Plus he had to rob the hardware store at some point, steal Judith's tombstone, etc. So let's assume he ate the dog. What, in the morning when Lori was dropping off the key? How in the f***? Would it still be warm? He could have seen inside. Bullsh random thing that breaks a window at this very moment is random. And bullsh. What do we do? He's been here once tonight. I think he'll come back. I'm gonna wait for him. Seriously, this podunk small town can't spare one cop to help Loomis out. By this point, there should be some sort of news about him. He broke out of Smith's Grove, he definitely murdered a guy, and he's clearly back in his old neighborhood. But sure, let's dedicate our entire police force elsewhere. It's Halloween, and somebody stole a mask out of a hardware store after all. Why do you keep him under there? Mom doesn't like me to have them. Great hiding place, dude. Your parents will never find that spot under the couch when they vacuum the living room. Lindsay, get this dog out of the kitchen right now. Lindsay. Tommy, there's nobody outside. All day, Lori's been seeing a scary dude staring at her at school from his trademark station wagon, from behind this hedge, and in the middle of this laundry. But as soon as Tommy says he sees somebody, Lori's lady boner over Ben Tramer overrides her concern. And he spills a little bit of water on herself. And that's as good a reason as any to take off both shirts and her pants in the middle of the kitchen with open windows all around. Well, never mind. Guess he found a hot date. That was clearly a whimper and not a sound that would make anyone think a dog was okay. And he might be a bigger dick to dogs than Michael. And he kills them and eats them for f**k's sake. I get that John Carpenter loves him some of the thing, but did we have to watch all 30 seconds of the opening? I mean, that's a 30 seconds of logo sin in a movie within a movie. What about the jack-o'-lantern? Half the movie. What about the rest of my comic books? Half the jack-o'-lantern. Jesus, how f**king long is this night? Also, they're making a jack-o'-lantern on Halloween night. What will they do with it afterwards? Put it out on November 1st? Think through your activities, Lori. Come on. I saw the boogeyman. I saw him outside. Lori's disbelief aside, which is bull by the way, this is what Tommy saw. He saw a dark figure standing out on a lawn that literally could be anyone. But because he's a kid that nobody believes, he's absolutely right about this. Paul, is this one of your cheap trips? Did Michael also have ninja training at the institution? Because he moves so stealthily, he doesn't even make a sound. Lindsay, come out here! Lindsay, I'm in the laundry room. The door won't open. 
Lindsay. Now why don't we not stand here talking about them and get down to doing them? Man, Michael Myers hit the jackpot with horny babysitters when he decided to come back to Haddonfield on Halloween night. Which brings up the question, how did he know who all the babysitters were when he came back? How did he choose these victims? He's been planning this all day, and it's not like he knows the babysitting situation in this town. I spilled butter all over my clothes there in the wash. Am I seeing things, or did she simply spill water on her clothes? And it was just a little bit. Like, even if that was butter, it wasn't all over her clothes like she claims. Oh, no keys. Sure, you might have thought the door was open, but how were you going to operate the car without your keys? You went straight to the car without looking for your purse. How damp for Paul do you have to be to forget keys? Wait a minute, did Michael have a copy of the key? Or does he know how to use a murder knife to break into cars? And man, Annie didn't even notice. Paul must be the best. What the hell was Michael doing in this car for the last 30 seconds to fog up the windows like that? Actually, scratch that. I'm okay not knowing the answer. There's no blood coming from her throat, so what exactly did he just slice that? Her ear? Also, what's the best way to emote a horrible death? Probably not this. Tommy picks the most insane moment to play a trick on Lindsay, as it's perfect timing to see Michael carrying Annie's lifeless body into the house next door. Zombie. Get your ass away from there. Loomis gets his Saved a Kid from Murder Boy Scout badge today. And if you are right, damn you for letting him go. What story did Loomis tell the sheriff about Michael's escape? How did that story turn into Loomis being the party responsible for? First I rip your clothes off, then you rip my clothes off, then we rip Lindsay's clothes off. I was told that ten years later this guy was fired from the Guardians of the Galaxy franchise. Lindsay is gone for the night. Hey, now that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, but Lindsay's parents have to come home at some point, right? Jesus, this might be the least sexy scene since Disclosure, but also some pretty good representation of high school sex. Also, based on where Linda's leg is and the direction Bob is thrusting, it would appear that Linda's thigh will be reaching orgasm in just a few seconds. Also, also, why is there a lit up pumpkin in this bedroom? Did they come up here and light up this jack-o'-lantern, or did somebody else do it and it's been sitting here for hours? Based on the actions of doors in this film, I think it's safe to say Scream 3 and Halloween take place in the same universe. Okay, Come on out. So, Michael watched them have sex, then came down here and hid in the closet just in case Bob checked it. Do I have that right? Because I'm gonna hit up Michael Myers for gambling advice later if that's true. I admit this knife is huge, but how the f*** does it go through Bob's body and into the door behind him, having enough strength to keep him suspended in the air? After the investigation is over, the hardware store Michael stole this knife from should be using this in their advertising. I love this iconic look of Michael cocking his head side to side when he looks at dead Bob. He's either admiring his own work or wrapped up in the beauty of what he did. I'll take a sin-off for it. A sin-off for murder? I mean, look. Don't you ever tell me that this guy, while as evil as Dr. Loomis says he is, doesn't have a sense of humor. And since he also has a car, Annie would love this guy if she was still alive. This motherfucker never looked for the car before this. Also, how is it even here? We know that Michael parked the car in front of Tommy Doyle's house, even though we haven't seen it again until now. And the Myers house is not across the street from the Doyle residence. Where exactly did Michael have that tombstone stash this whole time? Also, also, remember when Michael took Annie's body into the house? He had to have been setting this up then, and he had no idea Linda and Bob would be showing up. But when he saw them later, did he go back upstairs, hide Annie's body, and wait to kill them before setting it all back up? I mean, where the f*** was this guy stored so that this could happen? What the f*** is he hanging from? And why did Michael just leave him stuck on the pantry door? Jesus, what is up with these doors opening on their own? Do the slasher killers only case houses with automatic doors? So, um... Time to get the f*** out of the house, right? This guy's a top-notch fortune teller slash knife expert on the cutting edge of blade technology, and he takes a poor stab at slicing the sharp heroine of the movie. Also, she just broke a leg on both or is dead, right? No? Okay. Carry on. Michael somehow knew to use a f***ing rake to prevent Lori from going out this door. It's like he knew it would come to this. He didn't do this with any of the other victims, but Lori's the one he figured would be the most likely to escape. Man, people are super talented in the Halloween verse at breaking windows with their bare hands. I'd send this for the obvious heroin falls while running cliche, except I'm still flabbergasted that she can move at all after falling down those stairs. What the actual f*** was this guy waiting for the whole time? When did Michael ever have the chance to cut the phone line? He's been at the other house this whole time, and he was just about to catch up to Lori about five seconds ago. So in the time that Lori walked in here, he cut the phone line and apparently broke this window to get into the house. I mean, this reveal is a lie. This f***er had no chance to do this. And even if he did, why did he wait for Lori to f*** around with the phone and f*** before trying to kill her? Really feel like Lori not saying, so this, as she stabs him, was a missed opportunity. I'm surprised there isn't already a rake propped up against this upstairs bedroom door so that Lori can't turn the knob. Stab him in the face! Although, you're right, it probably doesn't matter. No one shoots a horror movie like Carpenter. So let's review. Michael was stabbed by a coat hanger, stabbed with a knife, shot four times, and fell out of the top floor of a house, and he's still alive. This guy did come from two human parents, right? Well, maybe not, now that I reflect on it. Since Michael killed Judith at the age of six and escaped 15 years later, shouldn't this read Michael, age 21? Movie doesn't know how to math or credits. I want you to knock on their door. I want you to tell them to call the police. 
previously on Halloween. This is weird, because at the end of the original film, Loomis didn't run downstairs. He was on the balcony when he saw Michael was missing. And the yard was mostly leaves and dirt. Here, it's a recently mowed lawn with not a leaf in sight. What's going on out here? I wonder if this character was referred to as Delayed Reaction Neighbor in the script, because those shots were fired at least a couple minutes ago. Call the police! Tell the sheriff I shot him! Yes, yes, tell the sheriff I shot him! But I did not shoot the deputy! Tell him he's still on the loose! Sam Loomis plays the pronoun game more than once, even after someone asked who the hell he is. Is this some kind of joke? I've been trick-or-treated to death tonight. You don't know what death is. If you think I can go through this entire film without giving a sin off for the magic that is this wacky Donald Pleasant's performance, then you are mistaken. I don't care how great your score is, this is almost three goddamn minutes of credits. You're getting a ding a ding ding a ding 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 What the f time is it? This movie is set on the same night as the original Halloween. It's like 35 in the morning, right? Ain't no one f***ing trick-or-treating now. I shot him six times. F***ing hell, Sam Loomis plays the longest oh. running throw in the history. Also, you shot him seven times, asshole. Let's review. Kerblam, 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 kerblam. You missed your kerblam, Mr. Loomis. I think it was the first one. Maybe you missed, but Michael certainly reacted like he got hit with that first one. Police in Haddonfield have just made the grisly discovery of three bodies in the upstairs bedrooms of this house. Since we're seeing Michael Myers mere minutes after he got shot and the neighbors called the police, how does the local news already have this story? There aren't even that many cops around. Just one car that Loomis tracked down a minute ago. I don't want these people to die, but why does Michael let them live? He's about to go out of his way to break into a house and kill a different random character. So why do these two get to survive? Movie doesn't know how to Halloween correctly. Leaving a blood trail when you steal someone's sandwich knife. And God damn it, Michael, did you have to get blood on the sandwich too? Michael is close enough to where the neighbor girl should realize he's there. This once again proves that peripheral vision does not exist in slasher films. His wife's always picking on him. He probably got angry and decided to start beating her. Casual domestic abuse jokes. Also, is there a reason why half of Haddonfield has their windows open tonight? Isn't this supposed to be October in Illinois? You know, like cold? Where'd it happen? Down on Orange Grove. That's right down the street. I know. You know? From the context clues of this scene, we know the girl was talking to her friend before she heard the screams from her neighbor. So her friend probably heard the news before the call, so how has she not brought this up yet? Phallic Halloween decorations. <laughs> Where did he jump up from? Was he just crouched on the floor? She even looks over to that side of the room. How did she not see him? I like one shots. They're cool. But this one is nearly worthless. We see the cops arrive, they get out of their cars, they walk up to the house, and then we see Lori getting wheeled out on a gurney, and the camera follows her until she gets into the ambulance. This is almost two minutes worth of a one take when all we needed to see was Lori being put in the ambulance, which would have taken five seconds. He's with a patient. Would you please wait in room A? Waiting in room A. Janet, get me some more coffee. Drunk doctors on duty. Even in 1978, this was fed up, right? Right? Oh, Lori. This is a third random adult that knows who Lori is. I'm not sure how small a town this is, but god damn it, this is starting to feel a little creepy. And not just because it's a Halloween film. Loomis thinks this guy carrying a bag of candy from trick-or-treating is Michael Myers. So he thinks that after killing a few babysitters, Michael decided, what the hell, I've already got the mask on, might as well go get some candy. Also, even though this asshole is not Michael Myers, he acts as suspiciously as the guy who pulls the gun on the bus in speed. Sam Loomis is not here for your crime! So Michael Myers has been in this street long enough that a speeding cop car should not run over him. But one does anyway. Is it him or not? Asking someone to ID a body when it is engulfed in flames. Across the street from the Doyle house, three kids. The one of them was Annie. This line reading. I understand we're going to stay on the air now. Uh, repeating for those of you who just tuned in. When the movie went back to the hospital, a reporter said, Repeating for those of you who just tuned in. Saying three people were found dead. Then it cuts to this mirror shot, and after the guy asks if they're staying on the air, he says the exact same thing in the same cadence as he did before. Paramedic creepers. Come on, Jimmy, we gotta roll. Another call came in. Another call came in? You mean from the crime scene that's been talked about for the last 11 minutes of this movie? You're just now getting a call about that? For fuck's sake, is there a timeline? Discount Dana Carve. Holy sh**. How far away were Sheriff Brackett and Dr. Loomis from the Wallace house? Jimmy and Bud are already there and have one of the bodies ready for transfer, but they just got the call in the previous scene, which was after Loomis and Brackett found out. He's dead. I saw him. I saw a man in a mask. It was him. No matter what you saw, how would you know it's Michael Myers? Nobody alive outside of Lori and Loomis knows what he looks like. The murders happened like an hour ago. Aside from that, this asshole didn't look at the dead body at all. He came by to tell the sheriff the bad news about his daughter, but didn't even look in the direction of the charborough trick-or-treater. You're talking about him like he's some kind of animal. Having this loud conversation while reporters are within earshot. He was my patient for 15 years. 
It became an obsession with me until I realized that there was nothing within him, neither conscience nor reason, that wasn't even remotely human. I'm sure Loomis is very concerned about Michael still being out there, but mostly I think he's just glad he found someone who hasn't heard his tales from Smith's Grove Sanitarium backstory yet. It's five minutes to your house, another five minutes back to the hospital. Mrs. Owls is going to kill me. So wait, you're concerned about being late to your job, but you entered the scene complaining about a Halloween party that was so lame that they had pinned the tail on a donkey and bobbing for apples games? Why did you stay so late at such a shitty party? I think you hate giving your friend a ride more than you hate being late for work. And wait. What's this? Your name's Karen? Also, if it's five minutes to Karen's friend's house and five minutes back to the hospital, then that would mean they're right next to the hospital. So if Karen has a shift right after the party, why did her buddy arrange this so that Karen would have to drive her back home? This is a clear separate car situation, and I wouldn't be surprised if they called out the friendship after this. There is one survivor, 17-year-old Lori Strode. The idea that a kid would walk around with a radio like this and would be listening to the local news instead of music is both ludicrous and sinful. Good thing there's a random sign here pointing the way to the hospital. How else are serial killers going to know where their surviving victim was taken? The streets between Chestnut and 10th are jammed with people and cars repeating that uh, these streets are Chestnut and 10th. They're just jammed with both people and well, cars. Sure Why did the reporter feel the need to repeat not only the names of the streets, but that they're jammed with people and cars? Why is that a point of emphasis when three teenagers were murdered? Is this guy smoking a spliff at the hospital? I mean, good for him, but this hospital's pretty liberal, even for 1978. Security guard is way too distracted to do his job and therefore allows evil inside the building cliché. There's a serious lack of patience or staff in this hospital for Michael to be able to roam around this easily without being spotted. He doesn't even seem to know how big or small of a town Haddonfield is, but if it's big enough to have a hospital this size and it's Halloween night, there should be at least a few patients in the waiting area or in rooms and a couple more doctors and nurses roaming around. God, they should have they should have handled it more carefully. Oh. Did Jimmy just walk into Lori's room and first thing ask this pronoun gaming question? They're supposedly in mid-conversation, so this must be the first time Michael Myers has been brought up. Why me? Your friends are dead, Lori. It's not all about you. Time's up, Jimmy. Why do they keep letting this asshole come in here and talk to Lori? Can this hospital set up some f***ing boundaries? Go tell Mr. Garrett we're having trouble with the phones. Right now. Just at the other end of the hall. Janet. But I don't even know how to use this thing. And there's no time to teach you, Janet. I've got some phone lines to investigate. The security guard hears the tiniest noise and decides, sure, I will waste time checking a trash bin because of that very unsuspicious noise and forget about the phone lines. Tonight on Trash Mysteries. Mr. Garrett sees blood on a box in the trash and then tries to touch it. Blood on a box? Just outside a hospital? Only one man can solve this case. Security guard to lieutenant detective, here I come. The box with the blood on it is mysteriously missing when this cat makes his jump to scare the audience. If you don't want people to break into places, how about you use something stronger than a lock that wouldn't keep a kid out of a school locker? Those HMH budget cuts were legit. This scene of Mr. Garrett and his flashlight goes on for all the some time, storing the meat thermometer by the screwdrivers. I think somebody broke into the storeroom. Someone has something very important to say, but the walkie-talkie is not working and there's only static on the other end cliché. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, but why is Michael Myers even here? A minute ago, we saw him hiding in the nursery. We know he's here for Lori, so why did he go back outside and into the storage area? This is way too many people showing up to vandalize a house that is merely symbolic in nature. No one has lived here for 15 years, remember? Whenever you start a riot, you must ask yourself, who am I trying to emotionally hurt when I throw these stones? Heightens my sense of security. How have they not taken this gun away from Dr. Loomis? I know it's a different time and blah blah blah, but he's already proven to be a little trigger happy. Well, maybe just having him along as a consultant instead of an interim deputy would be a better idea. Did this girl bring a lollipop to the riot? Empty. Plus we covered the whole East End of town. It really makes you wonder why no one has thought to check the hospital, since that's where Michael's one surviving victim is. I'm starting to think these police officers aren't very good at their job. Haddonfield was a pretty quiet town before tonight. Except for that pesky incident 15 years ago when a little boy butchered his sister on Halloween night. But, you know, other than that. That was a force inside him, biding its time. Good God, I'm glad you're new to this information, Deputy. I've been waiting to talk about this again for what seems like a whole half hour. Good to be back. In many ways, he was the ideal patient. He, he didn't talk, he didn't... Cry. Didn't even move. So, in the psychological game, someone who willfully doesn't talk is an ideal patient? Yeah, I'm worried about Bennett Tramer. He isn't home yet. Yeah, and he left the party at 10. Well, it's only a little after 11, boys. He was real drunk. Why are these kids running around the neighborhood looking for a cop when they could just call the station? 
Also, if you remember, Ben Tramer was mentioned in the first film as the boy that Laurie liked and might go to a dance with. With this and Laurie being pawed over by the horny EMT and having a drunk doctor perform surgery on her and, you know, Michael Myers, I would say Laurie is having one of the worst nights imaginable. Not only is there a severe lack of patience and personnel at this hospital, but they also keep it dark as sh**. Let's all bask in this hospital mood lighting. Um, so we find out that this is the asshole paramedic guy and he and Karen are apparently f***ing, but she came in here expecting a patient, right? So how did paramed dick know that Karen would be in here? Yeah, I know she's a nurse, but there are other nurses who could be assigned to this room. And here's another thought. Did he kick a patient out of this room so he could have sex with her? I can't leave the kids right now. But everybody's all worded out tonight. All this Michael Myers crap. Yeah, because a serial killer on the loose in a small town is a really silly thing to be concerned about. Bud needs oral, Karen. Think about him for once. Why won't you ever tell me anything? I told you. I'm not your mother. Lori conveniently dreams about her literal past after wondering why Michael Myers tried to kill her. This sequel is problematic for many reasons, but the most unforgiving aspect might be that they took the well-written and toughest nails heroine from the first film and stuck her in a bad wig and a hospital bed for the majority of the second film. Karen said earlier, I suppose if we left the door open, we, we could hear somebody was coming or one of the kids started to cry. But they're on a different floor and in a room that has enough ambient noise, there's zero chance they would hear anyone in the next room and definitely not a kid crying one or two floors up. If the hydrotherapy pool should not exceed 100 degrees, then why does it have a thermostat that exceeds 100 degrees? There's no scenario where it would need to be hotter. It's too hot in here now, but why don't you go check? It's cold out there. It can get cold in here. Boner bargaining. I can't imagine Michael Myers' hands look appetizing enough to make out with after all the killing he's done today. Movie cuts to a wide shot so that when Michael pulls her out of the water, you can see the nudity one last time before she dies. It's real classy that way. He got in here. And then politely closed the window after he got in? In here? So wait, Michael broke into the school for the express purpose of finding a child's family drawing so that he could stick a knife into the sister and tell everyone what he was planning? So you're Michael Myers, you want to kill your sister, you know she's going to the hospital, and you make a detour to the school because you need to symbolize your killing first. Got it. It's a Celtic word. Samhain. It means the Lord of the Dead. Which is actually pronounced Samhain, and Dr. Loomis should f***ing know that. I'm surprised he hadn't already worked it into one of his darkest eyes diatribes. I have to talk to you. Oh, I didn't recognize you. She's the same woman from the original Halloween who was in the car with Sam Loomis the night Michael escaped. That was so long ago, but it feels like yesterday. Oh, wait, it was. This guy in the background polishing the floors has always cracked me up. Is he an extra? Or just a worker in the building that refused to let a film shoot stand in the way of him getting his hours in? I want to know his story more than any of the other characters in this movie. Now so we get to see Michael walking around the hospital, and I'm wondering how he hasn't killed Lori yet. The phone lines were cut. The security guard was murdered. He has virtually no resistance at this point. Also, even though we find out the head nurse is dead later, it's weird nobody ever brought up the phones not working and didn't try and find Mr. Garrett to see his progress. I'm guessing phones are important at a hospital, right? Listen, um... But I will continue to randomly touch you, because I don't understand how to properly let a person know how I feel about them, and I have no concept of what personal space means. This is a really cool shot of Michael appearing from the darkness. But why the f*** is he here? Did he kill the doctor seconds ago, or did he just know someone would be here at this very moment? No one will be seated while Jimmy stares at the head nurse's open locker. Out of all the weapons he could choose from in this hospital, he chooses a scalpel. Michael thinks he stabs Lori, but she's not there. Somehow, she's outside wandering the halls after the nurse just left her. This means in the time just after the nurse closed the door, Lori set up the pillows on the bed to make it look like a person was sleeping there, then left without Michael seeing her, which would be hard since Michael was watching the nurse from the vending machine area just behind the front desk, which is right next to Lori's room. This is all in a matter of one minute. I have so many questions. Was Lori faking that she had a reaction to the medication earlier? And if so, why? How could she possibly know Michael was even in the hospital? Or that this was the exact moment he would be coming to kill her? Does she really like Jimmy or is she just in a state of shock? How did Michael's mask change in two hours? Are hot dog sandwiches? Walking, walking, walking. Excitement? Mr. Garrett? Yep, makes total sense that the hospital security guard would be randomly hanging out in a patient room. But based on the occupancy of this hospital, I guess that's more likely than an actual patient being in there. I can't find anybody. You mean you can't find some of the many people who are dead around here? If you've been looking everywhere, surely you've stumbled on some dead people by now. Jimmy is practically looking straight into the room past Jill. How does he not see Michael Myers' shadow behind the curtain? Not that I'm an advocate for seeing more on-screen deaths, but showing some creative kills for some of these characters that died off-screen would have at least been more exciting than all the walking through the hospital halls. How the f*** did Michael learn this sh**? Michael slashed tires and did whatever else to make sure no one could escape, but what was his plan if anyone else showed up to the hospital? Why hasn't anyone else showed up to the hospital? 
Wait, Lori! I'm just saying, tonight there have been at least three murders. A patient who was nearly murdered by the same guy is here at this hospital. All the tires are slashed outside, and you can't find anybody who works here. At what point do you realize that you need to shut the f*** up and not draw attention to yourself? Movie asks the question, what is more ridiculous than a butcher knife supporting the weight of a grown man hanging on a wall? And answers by lifting an adult woman off the ground on the strength of a f***ing scalpel. Lori looks directly at an exit sign, but still goes for doors that keep her inside the hospital. Why is there a window here that leads to some other random part of the building? What is this window's purpose when it's not letting heroines escape? Michael sees Lori calling an elevator, sees that it's coming down, and still walks towards her like he has plenty of time. I think Michael is in breach of contract with his druid employers when he did not disclose a previous injury that prevents him from running after victims. Michael could turn the head nurse into a blood dispenser, but can't stop an elevator door from slowly shutting. Checking for Michael Myers. By observing the way they died, the druids believed they could see omens of the future. Explaining reasons for Michael Myers. Samhain isn't evil spirits, it isn't goblins, ghosts, or witches. It's the unconscious mind. Oh. That's Stroud Girl. That's Michael Myers' sister. Weird. Lori was curiously absent during the opening scene of the first Halloween, and a younger sister who survived was never mentioned when anybody talked about the story. Lori was two when Michael killed his older sister, <laughs> and I distinctly remember Judith and her horny boyfriend discussing only Michael before they had sex for negative seconds. Two years after his parents died and she was adopted by the Strodes, they requested that the records be sealed in order to protect the family. Aren't adoption records always sealed after the adoption is complete? Why would they need to request that? And wouldn't the fact that Michael had a younger sister be known? Why would that have been a big f***ing mystery to Loomis? Sure, when she was adopted, it would be necessary to hide her identity in case Michael came looking for her, but I fail to see why Loomis needed to know where she went in order to better treat Michael, who never said or did s*** when he was at Smith's Grove. Also, how did Michael find her? Don't give me that, they have a special connection bullshit, because if they did, he wouldn't have done this dumbass shit when he tried to stab her in the room when she wasn't there. Also, also, if the Strodes were so concerned about protecting the family and Lori, then why would they have let her visit Michael? What does you fellas usually do? Fire a warning shot, right? None of this bullshit with Loomis being taken back to Smith's Grove is necessary. It's one big exposition dump that didn't need to lead to this. And can't this cop just radio the local cops? God damn, even when this guy doesn't even know where Lori is, he can't give her any privacy. Jimmy's life in this movie ends the way it began. Horny. Why all of a sudden is Lori not able to stand up? She literally ran to the car just a few minutes ago. <laughs> you were able to yell at Jimmy pretty well in the car a minute ago. I don't understand why you're like Kate Winslet at the end of Titanic before she picked up the whistle now. Help me! Oh yeah, there's no way he could have heard that. The doors were closed. Why the f*** is Michael all the way over there? <laughs> what? Hmm, I shot him six times earlier. Now I shall try five. Maybe it needs to be a specific number of shots for this to work. There's a two-way radio in the Marshall's car. I want you to go outside. Get on that radio and get hunt. I should have done this earlier now that I think about it, but goddammit, it's my turn to be the hero. I would have removed every sin if this door shattered when Michael walked through it. Lori fires two perfect shots into the darkest of eyes. <laughs> Playing Marco Polo without a pool. Sam and Lori can leave the canisters after they've turned them on, right? They don't actually have to stand there like victims. It's time, Michael. As we will find out seven years later, Michael Myers and Dr. Loomis survived this. Also, why couldn't this asshole lead Michael around the room a little bit more to give Lori some time to get the hell out of there? Also, also, Loomis seems pretty certain he's not going to kill anyone else in the hospital with this blast. No, who am I kidding? The only people in this hospital are the people we saw during the movie. There's no such thing as other people. Lori may be incapable of running at this point, but can't she at least try? Movie ends with the song Mr. Sandman while Michael Myers burns. We all know he'll be back in Halloween 3, though. Halloween 3 is going to be classic Michael Myers. I can just feel it. It definitely won't be about a bunch of kids who wear cursed masks and unleash the power of Stonehenge. I know. I know. That's completely random. Don't even know why I brought that up. Someone needs to explain how that knife made that sound, especially since it was simply being used to carve a pumpkin. I admit, it's how a serial killer would carve a pumpkin, but that sound isn't coming from that knife for any reason. Also, forget Michael Myers. Who's this crazed woman swinging this giant butcher's knife around a group of children? But the rest of the movie takes place in California, so it seems a bit dickish not to set the opening part of the film in Haddonfield. This is Marion from the original Halloween. Remember her? Yeah, me neither. But considering her one character trait is smoking cigarettes, it's kind of amazing she's not dead 20 years later. I kind of want to give Nurse Marianne a sin back, since she's actually acting smart by walking away from the house instead of into it, but she's still going to find a way to get killed, which means we have to waste a few more minutes of screen time until the inevitable, so f*** her.
<laughs> Wrong killer movie. We all know the hockey mask wearing villain comes from an entirely different series called Friday the 13 Mutant Ninja Turtles. Also, is that Joseph Gordon Levitt? Here's a sin, Joseph Gordon Levitt. Hasn't anyone told you? Secondhand smoke kills. Discount Andrew Garfield. 4946 Cypress Pond. Why wouldn't Marion call the cops herself? Is there some strict rule in her neighbor's household to never let anyone else use the phone, even if they're calling the cops? One of the composers of this movie is Marco Beltrami, who did Scream. But the problem with letting Beltrami do any of the score is that it sounds exactly like Scream's music. Like, he just gave them all the unused compositions. The director said, let's have your character eat one bite of a Halloween cookie. It'll make you look even more like Joseph Gordon-Levitt. I guess this automatic door thing didn't stop with the first film. So how did it go from fairly bright outside to darkness in like two minutes? Because if you tell me it's symbolism, I refuse to learn anything. So much for the cops. By even my most conservative estimate, and even though it went from day to night in no time, there is no way 15 minutes passed for her to give up on the cops so soon. Obvious publicity photo of Donald Pleasance on the set of an earlier Halloween film stupidly masquerading as a personal photo of the character is obvious and stupid. Why would Loomis have a file on Laurie Strode? She was never one of his patients. And considering we find out later she's changed her name and been hiding out in California for the last 20 years, how would Loomis even know where the f*** she was? Also, even if Michael was able to assume Dr. Loomis had info on Laurie's whereabouts, how did he find out that he could ransack Marion's house to find those files? Marion was a nobody in the first film. She drove the car that Michael would steal, but that's about it. Also, also, what the f*** has Michael Myers been doing for the past 20 years? Since these films are choosing to ignore parts 4 through 6, the last time we saw him he was being burnt alive. So he just ran away on fire, stopped, dropped, and rolled, and then what? Jimmy! Like, what even compelled Michael to come over and kill the neighbors? Let's review! Michael broke into Marion's house, found a file on Laurie Strode, then camped out at the neighbor's house. He let them all live while Jimmy called the cops, waited some more, then killed the kids, and came back to Marion's house? What the f***? Meanwhile, Michael's improved his standing dead people up next to doors that he somehow knows someone will open at just the right time technique. He needs to give Jonathan Silverman and Andrew McCarthy a call because they couldn't get that right for two movies. You know what movie? Go f*** yourself. Marion survived two encounters with this maniac. There should be a slasher movie rule that if you survive one film, you get a pass for the rest of the franchise. Those cops don't hear a f***ing car pulling out of the driveway of the very house they're looking at. Damn, I saw a thing on 60 Minutes on him. Spent his life tracking down that Halloween guy who butchered all his kids up in Haddonfield, right? Michael Myers. Thanks, random forensics guy. You've successfully updated us on the plot of every Halloween movie except for part three. But bonus points if you can somehow sneak that exposition in. <laughs> Haddonfield news. <laughs> Also, Haddonfield can apparently support two newspapers, as this one is called Haddonfield Times. The movie can preach the H20 sh all day, but the title screen and every bit of advertising made this movie look like it was called Halloween Water. Wow, this is a movie newspaper article that actually appears to be about the events in the film. Let's go ahead and take away one. Oh, wait, no. We're on to fetus experimentation stats by the third paragraph, and the article next to it is titled Midwest is Drowned in Rain, and has nothing to do with H2O, just like this movie. I met him. 15 years ago. Fake Dr. Loomis narration. Is that a fucking police sketch of the mask? Introducing Josh Hartnett. They wrote a separate article about Judith's headstone being stolen. Jesus, must have been a slow news day. It's not like there was a mask killer who had hacked up some teenagers the previous evening. Newspaper article somehow makes the mistake of saying the Halloween murders were in 1968 and not 1978. This movie is H2O, not H3O. Glad movie clues us in as to why we should care about October 31st. Otherwise, I might have thought it was to mourn the anniversary of Houdini's death or celebrate Mount Rushmore being completed. Horror movie victim thinks she sees previous stalker, closes her eyes, and when she opens them, he's not there anymore, cliche. We could have a roaming orgy. Wait, Hey, little man Tate scored Jody Lynn? Michael Myers returning after a 20-year hiatus might be the second most unbelievable thing in this movie. Someone might have taught him to drive at the Institute, but doesn't appear anyone taught him how to change a flat tire. Also, this is all a setup for Michael to steal a car. I guess this was the only way to do it? How long has he been waiting in this desolate rest area? Also, this is the same car he drove from Illinois. When Michael buys gas, does he use self-service? Or does he put on a slutty Halloween outfit to get an attendant to do it? Or does he kill the whole gas station? I'd love to know. Nay, I must know. Also, also, Michael broke into Marion's house and stole the stuff in Lori's folder. So somewhere in all that, there was information where she relocated after faking her own death. Also times three. What was the point of this scene? No one dies in it, and there was no reason for Michael's car to have to break down. There's so much padding in this movie. If they didn't add bull scenes like this, it would be 45 minutes tops. Man, there is so much inconsistency with the mask in this series. I can't even understand why at some point it wasn't just retired. Even if he didn't die in the fire, surely a rubber mask didn't make it, and it looks brand new. Guess who has a fear of 102 nests to damn it. <laughs> but they still had you come to this gathering. Oh, good morning, Miss Tate. At last, Janet Lee plays alongside her daughter in a movie that's not The Fog, which doesn't count because nobody saw that. Anyway, two scream queens together, and they're related. But hey, I see Adam Arkin in this scene. Is his dad too good for Halloween H2O? Yeah, yeah, probably. Also, everyone bemoans the fact that Donald Pleasance's great career had to end with Halloween 6, but no one seems to mention that this was sadly Janet Lee's last theatrical release. Talk about taking one for the family. 
leading to two tumultuous, round, melon breasts. It's hard to believe, but this is literally LL Cool J's audition for Deep Blue Sea, mistakenly included in H2O. Wait a minute, Deep Blue Sea? H2O? I'm beginning to notice a pattern here. Yep, that's it. Both movies suck. We're paying the bills, aren't we? Ah! Instead of a jump scare, which was the intent, this is more of a jump angry. Like, instead of ah and fright, I was like, ah, kill all the phonies. And that can't be healthy. No, your mom told me the next time I let you loose, I was gonna Look, be fired. Man. The next time? Why weren't you fired before? This sounds like it's happened more than once. Ronnie, don't you get your ass fired with No one would be able to hear Ronnie's girlfriend with the phone nowhere near anyone's ears. Damn it, Halloween movies. There are other ways to show that it's Halloween other than having kids unrealistically trick-or-treating in the middle of the day. These are totally some of the same kids she saw on the other side of the street running past her now. Clown girl here, clown girl there. Ah, Adam Arkin. <laughs> Come on. I see more people dressed up f***ing around during the days of Halloween movies than I ever do on actual Halloween night. Also, does no one go to school in this town? Because all the s*** that's going on in your head is leaking out on me, and I can't take it anymore. That would explain that haircut. 20 years. Don't you think he would have shown up by now? Yep, looks like Lori is as clueless about vehicles behind her as she was 20 years prior. Psycho. Hey, I can name other Janet Lee movies too. There's, um, well, there's Psycho, and, uh, that one where she, you know, I mean, definitely Psycho, then probably something with Tony Curtis, I'm guessing, and I'll think of it. Oh yeah, The Manchurian Candidate, Touch of Evil, and Bye Bye Birdie. Whew. Since we know that Michael isn't on the grounds yet, this attempt to be scary serves zero purpose. Where the f*** did John get the flowers? Those are clearly store-bought, and the only thing they had time to get while in town was the stolen booze. Twenty years have passed and nothing's changed. Michael always finds a way to be noticed at school by one of the main characters from her seat in the back of the classroom. Do you have any thoughts on Victor and Elizabeth? Or any thoughts on that f***ing guy in a creepy mask you just saw out the window? Might be a good idea to bring that shit up. It was about redemption. It was his fate. Jesus. Even the exact same classroom talk about fate that Laurie was talking about in the original happens 20 years later. But wouldn't this parallel be better served with the Josh Hartnett character, since that would tie into the family dynamic? She changed her mind about Yosemite. Is now you're going? I wouldn't say that. But how exactly would he get away with this? As overprotective as Laurie is, she's not going to be at the buses to see him off. And crazily enough, that's exactly what happens. Just gonna add a hundred cents here for the jump scares. They're clearly the dumbest jump scares ever committed to film. Well, hey, it's Halloween. I guess everyone's entitled to one good scare. Nice callback and all, but Lori should immediately go buy lottery tickets because she has a much better chance at winning the jackpot than having that exact same phrase said to her twice in her lifetime after literally being jump scared. Miss Tate, I know it's not my place. If I could be maternal for a moment. Yeah, this movie sucks all the balls, but this is truly a sweet moment between real-life mother and daughter, getting to act together for the last time. You had me at Miss Tate. You had me at Miss Tate. Score decides to pay homage to the Psycho theme music, as if to torture us with a much better film. And by better film, I mean that totally unnecessary remake of Psycho that came out four months after this movie. Also, cool homage to Psycho and all, but does this school not have a parking lot? Jesus, how long did it take these buses to get to the front gate? It was daylight when they left. Also, 28 seconds of buses driving. So earlier today, Michael stopped by the school grounds to stare into classrooms, and then decided to drive all the way the f*** out here to wait for the buses to drive by. Like, there are a million places he could have hidden that didn't require driving halfway to Yosemite. I want to tantalize myself with your sweet nectar. Deepest, bluest, my hat is like a shark's fin, she replied. Why is Ronnie still there? Does he have to work a 24-hour shift? I might be checking with my union rep to see if that's legal. Well, I don't know who this is. Better open up the gate. There is no way Michael could have gotten out of the car and hid in the time it took Ronnie to walk out of the office to the gate. I mean, what? Does Michael have mosquito feet or something that would prevent his footsteps from being heard? There are all sorts of leaves and shit all over this road. Either Michael drove this the perfect amount of time it took for the battery to go out, or he has a remote control for this 1924 Model T Ford or whatever the fuck it is he stole at the rest stop. Why doesn't Michael kill Ronnie here? He's got the advantage, and Michael doesn't know how terrible Ronnie is at his job. To his knowledge, Ronnie is the one guy on campus with a gun. So kill him already. Also, lucky for Michael that most of the school went on that Yosemite trip. I mean, he's a badass, but he would have had a hard time taking out an entire school. Hello? Michael was literally just staring at the back of Ronnie's head. When could he have cut the phone lines, assuming they're not right outside that window of the guard shack? <laughs> ah, Adam Arkin! In this universe, Scream 2 the movie exists, which means the first Scream exists, which means all the references to the Halloween universe in those two movies exist, which means a full collapse of these universes as we know them. You have got to be kidding me with these f 
f***ing candles, guys. Are you telling me the school had this many candles lying around? Or that they bought this many? Or that they thought they needed this many? I want to know who's behind the candle cabal. Also, what the f***ing kids make corn on the cob? Movie doesn't know how to teenage, right? My name's not Carrie Tate. She waits until they're making out to spring this news on him? Can Will not swallow or spit out whatever the f*** he's gnawing on before making out? Because if that's some kind of fetish, it's f***ing weird. They locked him up for a long time, but he got out and he came after me. Are you going to tell him that you had no idea he was your brother until Halloween 2? A movie that apparently exists in your universe since the Scream franchise does? What happened to the sister? She died, right? No, she faked her death. It's kind of strange that H2O ignores Halloween 4 through 6 where Lori died in a car crash, but takes that plot point to create a soap opera plot twist that she faked her death. He sat in a sanitarium for 15 years waiting for me. And then one rainy night, he decides to go trick-or-treating. Wait a minute. Well, was Michael trick-or-treating that night? Then he was doing that all wrong. Why does Michael care about anniversaries and birthdays? In the first movie, he waited 15 years to kill people on Halloween. And in this one, he waited 20 for some reason. All because his nephew turned 17. This anniversary trigger is totally whack. I get that this would be a bit scary to stick your hand down a disposal, but how does he expect the switch to turn on by itself? It's as if he knows he's in a movie called Halloween H2O and he's about to be killed. Also, after all this buildup with the hand and the disposal, the fact that he doesn't get his hand chopped off is 100% a sin. No sex games till I've eaten. Can't the eating be part of the sex games? Oh my god! How the f does Michael know when people are going to discover the body? He sets this shit up perfect every time. What do you think they're doing? It kind of reeks a cheap scare, doesn't it? Character in movie full of nothing but cheap scares criticizes a cheap scare that his friends might be trying to pull off. Did Steve Miner just tell the actors if they couldn't think of anything else to do to pretend that they were chewing on something? God, the eating in this movie. What a waste of time these last couple of minutes have been. Look, I know the story is the story and whatever happens, happens. But Sarah escaped Michael through the dumbwaiter shaft just two minutes ago and is now being stabbed to death. This movie could have done just about anything that was cooler with the dumbwaiter, but it chose inevitable stabbing death instead. <laughs> When did Michael cut the power? The garbage disposal was working just a minute ago, and there's a light on in the room behind them. How the f did Michael set up this death reveal so quickly? Think about the f he has to do to make this work. He needs a stepladder and a conveniently hanging light bulb wire to make this sh happen. Not to mention that he knew for a fact that there would be such a setup in this pantry. Also, I thought the power was out, so how exactly does this work? Also, also, what the f did he have against Sarah? Charlie just got a slice of the neck, but she really got worked over. I'm guessing he's not that big a she's all that whatever it takes fan. Michael, an incredibly efficient killer, stabs John's leg instead of anywhere that might kill him faster. How in the f is John running? He just got stabbed in the leg. Damn, Molly, you wouldn't have lasted one day on the creek. Michael fruitlessly stabs the air from outside the gate, I guess hoping that one of these stupid kids will run towards the knife and stab themselves. Man, how f***ing great would this scene have been in a good movie? Who was that? My brother. Who I just told you about earlier. Convenient, right? Life of a final girl, what can you do? Also, I know Lori's older and accepts Michael Myers being her brother, but I sincerely doubt she'd refer to him that way. It's not like they have any real familial connection at all. It's not like they played trouble together when they were kids. And wouldn't she disown him in some way due to, you know, the evil? Harry! <laughs> Is Will seeing shit now too? Because that was clearly Michael and not Ronnie. Also, why the f would Ronnie be walking into the school without yelling for help or someone he knows? Guy just walked in here like a zombie. It's no wonder that Will thought he was Michael Myers, even though he could have waited a few seconds to confirm it. Also, also, did Eamon Arkin even hit LL Cool J once during this shooting? He was especially good at hitting the flower sconce, but I don't think one shot actually hit him. Maybe Michael would also have a solid career as a knife demonstrator. He can make butcher knives hold people up high in the air with the greatest of ease. <laughs> This is yet another car won't start in a horror movie cliche that seems bullshittier than the last one you probably remember. I want you to drive down the street to the Beckers. It's a mile down the road. Hopefully Casey isn't too busy on the phone when you get there. How did he keep his body either prostrate or scrunched up enough to stay hidden while Lori walked through this hallway? This motherfucker must hit the gym three times a day. Also, this seems to say that Michael knew Lori would come back after driving away. He saw the car drive off, shrugged, went back into the school, jumped to the ceiling, and fucking waited. Total goddamn bullshit. I can maybe understand Michael being able to walk without anyone hearing him, but jumping on a goddamn table without anyone hearing him? <laughs> Flagpole sitter. Yeah, he's totally dead, Lori. Good thinking. In the first movie, Loomis shot him six times and he fell out a window, and he burned to death in Halloween 2. So this should take care of it, and you shouldn't worry at all, and you should totally disarm yourself. He's dead. He's dead. He's, he's dead. LL Cool J. It's like the opposite of a deus ex machina. This is like a hominem ut defectum, which roughly translates to human f***ing shit up. Also, how the f*** is this asshole still alive? Dude was in a pool of his own blood, even though we never saw Adam Arkin hit him with one f***ing bullet. I'm fine, a bullet just grazed me. Yeah, that's why I looked totally dead and didn't wake up for 10 minutes of the movie. A f***ing graze caused that? 
you. Even if I'm willing to overlook Michael's clear sense of dramatic timing for his resurrections, I am not f***ing buying that he can see through a goddamn body bag to know when Laurie is looking at him. Come on. Come on what? Run the f*** over him. Multiple times. In fact, just drive the van on top of him and put it in park. Instead, Laurie waits for him to get up to do this for some reason, putting herself in danger by trying to drive him off a cliff and taking the van with it. <laughs> Laurie survives this. Axe on the ground that was previously in the van is conveniently waiting outside for Lori so that she doesn't have to get it from the van that is now on fire. Come on. F*** you, movie. Also, is Michael seriously playing the sympathy brother-sister card here? And even if he's smart enough to think of that, isn't he also smart enough to know it won't work? All right, movie. Well played, and one sin earned back. Also, there shouldn't be any more movies after this. Wait, you see there's a Halloween resurrection that came out four years later, and it stars Busta Rhymes? It stars Busta Rhymes? This is one instance where he should have stopped saying, give me some more. Also, also, man, it would be seriously messed up if in the next film, Lori is in an insane asylum because she actually killed a paramedic and not her brother. Thank God that doesn't happen. Reading. I'm all broken up here, bitch. I can't work. Movie insists on an orgy of evidence that Michael Myers grew up in a broken home. Take that damn thing off. You know what makes horror movies really good? Delving into the killer's home life when he was a kid and getting into the deep psychological roots of mass murder. We were fighting, right? You were there. He was like, oh, I'm not gonna fight you. Like, ah. The only thing bullies ever do is get into fights and talk about fights they got in. They have no other interests or character traits. Man, years of spy kidding really set this kid down the wrong path. Angry bully who wants to beat up Michael Myers somehow doesn't see Michael Myers staring at him as he walks right towards him. It's hard to believe that anyone in this family would concern themselves with carving a jack-o'-lantern for Halloween. We have deranged kid Michael Myers, the damaged stripper mom, a baby, the slutty daughter, and William Forsythe. Who's carving pumpkins? No one, that's who. Despite the newspaper clipping advertising a topless show, this strip club apparently has a tops on policy. And this movie isn't PG-13. And Sherry Moon Zombie has never been shy about this kind of thing before. Just kind of curious, that's all. Meanwhile, the movie has no problem showing grown-up Jenny from Forrest Gump topless, or grown-up Jamie Lloyd from Halloween 4 and 5 topless, or, well, let's face it, everyone except Sherry Moon Zombie is topless in this movie. You know, considering the killing spree that Michael Myers goes on after he eats this candy, the candy corn, the circus peanut, it's easy to blend the sugar. Or at the very least, the substandard Halloween treats. I've almost completely forgotten about the abuse, neglect, and the fact that he's already killed a guy at this point. And plus, there was this ominous warning from his mother before she left. Don't eat too much candy. And all he remembers later is his costume and his candy. Hey, that's creepy. What the f*** are you looking at? To the untrained eye, there's nothing visually abnormal. I don't know about that, Sam. A long-haired, blonde, ten-year-old with dead eyes? I think I'd go to great lengths avoiding this kid just on instinct. Has anyone else been admitted into this entire hospital? Yeah, let's just turn our back on the psycho killer while he has eating utensils in front of him. And why do they even let this kid have real eating utensils anyway? This kid is eating, like, corn, peas, and bread. The f*** does he need a metal fork for? And even if he's eating steak, f*** him! 30 seconds of slow motion screaming. Who the f*** does the hiring at Smith's Grove Sanitarium anyway? Also, I guess no explanation needs to be made for drunken, rapey rednecks, but I really don't understand what's gained by performing this task in Michael Myers' cell. I mean, why don't you just go ahead and add autoerotic asphyxiation to the mix? So far, Michael has killed only people we wanted to see dead anyway. You almost kinda root for this crazy bastard. Okay, except for now. When you kill Danny Trejo, it's personal. That's a new paint job! Don't mess it up! Why does every character that we know is going to die later an insufferable dick when they enter the picture? I mean, is this movie making murder cathartic for us? Maybe we're the real monsters. Now you're f***ing with my head, Rob Zombie. Flipping through a porno mag while taking a number two. You don't want a boner while sitting on a public toilet, dude. In case you didn't know Michael is doing something really, really violent, the camera shakes on every impact so it's easy to figure out. Michael doesn't seem the kind of killer to care about a new outfit, really. But I guess there's still some part of him that cares about taking a black man's clothes for his own? Lori Strode, who we know is Michael Myers' younger sister all grown up, solves the nature versus nurture debate with inappropriate bagel behavior. Did you ever hear about the Mexican Wolfman? <laughs> How could she? That movie isn't for another three years, and Benicio Del Toro is Puerto Rican. They have the candy corn, kid. Movie continues conceit that either sugar or third-rate candy makes you crazy. Wait, he had time to bury all this sh on the floorboards right after he killed his family? Um, uh, shove the envelope inside the mail slot. Seriously, what kind of important brochure or document needs to be placed in the mail slot at the old Myers home? Who is this for, and why would it need to be delivered here? Hey, f my porch lights are not on, and there are no Halloween decorations around, and I've got machine guns attached to my sprinkler system. Everything about my house says go away. This movie must be absolutely required to have a jack-o'-lantern in almost every scene. What's with these hot chicks banging guys way below their pay grade? First Michael's older sister, and now the hottest cheerleader in the school? Haddonfield must have like zero hot guys. But you'd think this chick would be nailing a college dude, or an assistant professor at Northwestern or something. Hey, cool kill. 
It's almost exactly like that one from another horror movie I saw a long time ago. I can't remember the name. Anyway, Michael's knife isn't nearly long enough to pin this guy to the wall. And even if it was, his weight would make this morbid arts and crafts project come tumbling down. Wow, Michael got every detail of this ruse down pat. Except the boyfriend was bringing up a six-pack, not just one beer. Michael Myers is a dick to other dudes' girlfriends after killing their boyfriends. In case you were wondering about where Dr. Sam Loomis got his gun in the first Halloween, here's a completely necessary scene showing you the ins and outs of the purchasing process. Great, just wrap it up. Also, Illinois has a 72-hour waiting period to possess a handgun after purchase, but Loomis found the one store that doesn't give a f So the Wallaces are finally out of my face? I'm not sure why Michael came to this house. How did he know where Annie was babysitting tonight? I don't see how he figured this out or even had time to figure it out. He was camped out at his old house. He killed the naughty couple, he came over to the Strode residence and killed Lloyd's parents. Now he just magically shows up at this random house where Annie is? I read your book. The sheriff apparently keeps a book he hates sitting around on his desk all day just in case the author shows up. I think you have created quite the masterpiece of a monster off the blood of this town because monsters sell books. The disbelieving sheriff is a cliche in movies, but never with so much evidence being ignored. The news of what Michael did at the sanitarium apparently still isn't big news, not even enough to put this hometown sheriff on alert. Hello, you have reached the Strode residence. We can't come to the vault. Ironic happy answering machine message when things are not happy cliche. Let's go. The sheriff is now worried that something is wrong because the Strodes didn't pick up their phone. Even with the backstory he provides later, somebody not answering their phone isn't that big of a deal. Why does the blonde haired kid have to come pick Annie up to drive her a distance she could easily walk and already did walk? Why didn't Annie's boyfriend just come to pick Annie and Lindsay up when they were carrying all that shit over? I mean, Lindsay already knows what Annie and Paul are gonna do, so he isn't some mystery to her. You know you're gonna share something with Paul. Does Annie ever lock the door, even when she's having dirty, filthy sex with her boyfriend? This is the second time Michael has just wandered into the house without breaking in. You probably will say crazy things under duress, but Lori tells Lindsay to run home and call the police. They are actually in Lindsay's home right now. Which, and I'm no child psychologist, might confuse a kid, especially in a traumatic situation, but she ends up going to the little boy Tommy's house anyway, and then doesn't appear to remember why she even came here. How long is it going to take to get there? It's about 10 minutes. Where in Haddonfield does it take 10 minutes to get anywhere? We've seen people walking all over the neighborhood and to school in less time, and you've been driving forever. <laughs> Apparently no one in the entire neighborhood is at home tonight, or cares about someone screaming in the middle of the street. And this is after the little girl did it two minutes ago. Michael was keeping excellent pace with the limping, screaming Lori before, but apparently he stopped for a snack during the chase and it took him forever to catch back up. So I guess Lindsay did indeed call the cops, but once they got all the information, why didn't they go to Lindsay's house? You know, where there are actual dead and injured people? Remember, Lori called the police too. Wouldn't the police lump those two calls together and realize they needed to go to the murder house? But the cops show up here for some reason, just in time to be slaughtered by Michael Myers. What the f*** was Michael waiting for this whole time? Was he actually waiting around for the cops to show up before he broke into this bathroom? Lori was screaming her lungs out in Michael's arms before, but I guess she fainted between this shot and the next shot. Hell if I know. There still isn't anyone who cares about anything in this neighborhood. Even after the cops showed up and there was even more screaming. You mother Seriously? Your first target was his shoulder? I guess it's possible that the Myers family had a random pool in the backyard, but how do you miss this monstrosity, even if you're running for your life? Clearly, everyone in this neighborhood went to Chicago for the night. In Haddonfield, no one hears you scream, or hears gunshots. If you think Michael is some kind of special boogeyman, wouldn't you wait until the authorities showed up before leaving him in the pool, even if you think he's 100% dead? Okay, now that you've been let go and there's this whole big wide world for you to run into, you decide to go up the stairs? Sure. Yeah, based on a film you might have heard of and never needed to be remade. You might want to look it up sometime. Beyond useless 8mm films of young Michael Myers doing stuff. Three of them there, plus a window decoration. One on top of the fridge, plus decoration on the fridge. Same fridge, same ones, but two more decorations. Also, there's one on a cereal box faintly on top of the fridge, and one on a newspaper on the kitchen table peeking out. There's another one behind William Forsythe on the stripper newspaper clipping. Six decorations on the TV. Plastic one on the chair by the front door. Plastic one. Could be the same one from earlier, but in a different scene. Someone walking behind Michael with a different plastic one. Yet another kid with a plastic one to collect candy. Three real ones in the front yard, two decorations on the house, and one more plastic one for candy. Decoration mask in Michael Myers' cell on the right side. Decoration on window, real one on the filing cabinet, and blurry decoration on filing cabinet. Two in the yard, plastic one on the porch. Two already counted, four in the other yard. Another one on the porch, almost hidden to the right of the door. 
Decorations on front porch steps. Six in the corner behind Michael Myers. Three at the house across the street. That one. Plastic one in the van. Real one on the table behind the couch. Three paper craft ones in the gun store. Background decoration behind car. Rear view mirror. Two of them. The shelf. Two on the stairs. One orange Christmas light one in the bushes. Real one in foreground. Decorative centerpiece on table. Real one on table. Two decorations in the background and another small real one shows up on the table. Decoration in real one as the camera passes. Plastic one in decoration as it goes further. Plastic on the outdoor table. Two in the background. Annie carrying one. Four glowing ones in the yard. Four on the porch. Smash one on the street. Glowing decoration next door. Smash one on dead guy. Background kitchen. Two on the porch. One next door. Two more on the porch as Lori runs for her life. In the Myers death trap. During credits before casting. During credits before Danny Trejo credit. One before Udo Kier credit. One before William Forsyth credit. 55 seconds of logos. Also Comcast and Miramax. While they didn't give Aaron Corey an apple, that scarf might as well be one because it makes him look straight up like an asshole. For years he's been kept here to be studied. I suppose the state has lost interest in discovering anything further. I get this is supposed to be a direct sequel to the original 1978 film, but Michael Myers disappeared at the end of that film after Dr. Loomis shot him six times! So how did Michael get back to the hospital? And yeah, yeah, they try to retcon it a bit with the Hawkins character, but f*** you, movie, and you better f***ing believe this will not be the only time I bring up why this being a direct sequel to the original doesn't f***ing work at all. Oh, make no mistake, he's aware. He was watching you as you arrived. F***ing how? Maybe one thing they discovered about Michael Myers was that he literally has eyes in the back of his head? Or eyes connected to the security cameras when they drove up? Perhaps you'd like to tie your left shoelace? Mr. Tavoli here has a fixation for such things. Underestimate no one. But feel free to walk amongst them. They usually just ignore you. I've been following your case for years and still know very little about you. Probably because all he did was kill his sister and then years later showed back up and killed a trucker, a couple of teenage girls, and some horny dude named Bob who may or may not have been a pedophile. I mean, his murder spree story wouldn't even get a whiff from my favorite murder. So why is this podcast bothering with it? Now, if you had nine more movies worth of murders... You feel it, don't you, Michael? You feel the mask. No, no, he sees it, remember? Also, we're really gonna say Michael has this big connection to a mask he stole from a hardware store back in 1978? Besides, we know this bullshit wouldn't be in this good a condition after all these years anyway. Also, also, man, I would give every sin back if they had a scene showing the podcasters opening up a 1978 Captain Kirk mask and painting it to turn it into this. Also, times three. This might make for great television, but it would make for a terrible f***ing podcast. You'd just hear some guy saying bullshit like this, and he could be in his mom's basement reciting this as far as you know. Ah. Oh. Say something! Basically, that was seven minutes of nothing happening, all before the main title screen. Nobody dies because of this guy taunting Michael with his old mask, and oh sure, we now know he's connected to it, and that will come up later when he escapes. But that's all nostalgia bull I just can't take this seriously. Also, out of 11 films, we have three named simply Halloween? This seems, well, this seems stupid. Should have just bit the bullet and called it Halloween H40, because it's one Josh Hartnett and a girl from the creek away from being just that. Could it be that one monster has created another? Dude, can't you wait to record this when you're not driving? No zoom and drive, man. Besides, can't your partner do the driving while you do this? How does $3,000 sound? Whoa, whoa, why start at $3,000? Why not try like a thousand first and see if that does the trick? Movie doesn't know how to lowball. Our last project shed new light on a murder case from 20 years ago. Well, actually it raised more questions than it answered, and people still think Adnan did it. I believe in Michael Myers, a deranged serial killer, but the boogeyman. He's not a serial killer, right? Especially if we're, let's all say it together now, making this a direct sequel to the original film. Maybe a spree killer or simply a mass murderer, but not a serial killer, since he killed just about everyone in the same goddamn place and with one exception on the same goddamn day. Two failed marriages, rocky relationship with your daughter and granddaughter. This is how you get a story? Bringing up failed marriages and bad relationships? Michael Myers murdered five People. Oh, come on. We're not even gonna acknowledge all those deaths he was responsible for in Halloween 3, Season of the Witch? I have a photographic memory. He'll be locked away until the end of his days. That's the idea. He already was, though. He's perfectly fine at Haddonfield. A hospital with a 40-year containment streak should not be messed with. I showed him the mask. It was nothing. No response. Nothing. With the exception of a random gust of wind, a bunch of other inmates cackling, and a dog barking. But yeah, nothing out of the ordinary. Oh, man. I got peanut butter on my penis. Well, that's why you don't pull your out while making a sandwich. At least not that kind of sandwich. Can you stop? I gotta clean this peanut butter off my hand. You clearly said penis earlier, and now I'm wondering if you just did that for the shock value in front of your daughter. Wasn't it her brother who, like, cold-blooded myrtillated all those teenagers? Myrtillated. No, that's just a bit that some people made up to make him feel better, I think. Why would Michael being Lori's brother make people feel better? Of all the reasons people would make up about a story, why would making them feel better be the first thing you think of? This is the I did it to protect you of urban legend coping. Fate took a different course. Fate took a different course? More like fate 
took the same course that the original Halloween and Halloween H2O did. Nice try, movie. F*** your rhyming couplets. Ah, Jamie Lee Curtis! Dr. Samuel Lewis, January 22nd, 1979. My suggestion is termination. That's not Sam Loomis. That's 100% Ernst Stavro Blofeld. Completely different characters with no connection whatsoever. Don't even look it up. Looks like Jamie Lee Curtis went to the Denzel Washington School of drinking inside a parked car for actors portraying alcoholism and took advanced placement courses. I guess it's a heavy night for Haddonfield hospital transfers, huh? Weird they decided that Michael Myers and a whole bunch of his fellow patients needed to get moved on the same night. Michael Myers is still my patient until he's in somebody else's care. So I'm seeing my duty through till the end. Yeah, but you could drive your f and not riding a bus of convicted mentally ill patients, which they would never let you do anyways. We're going as Bonnie and Clyde. Skip! Yeah. Judy Greer looks as f***ing irritated as I am that she's being wasted in yet another terrible movie. I'm glad you got to see that. I never told you how I spent my childhood. But I will conveniently right now before Michael Myers comes back to terrorize the family after being dormant for 40 years. Also, Halloween movie steals the John Connor backstory from Terminator 2. Lumpy, you stay here. I'm gonna make sure no one's hurt. You call the police. Or how about you call the police and protect your son from what appears to be a bunch of lunatics walking in the middle of the road. Or just be a shitty parent. That seems to be a pretty common occurrence in Haddonfield. Run! Dude, do you really think I go around taking advice from people with bloody faces? Michael couldn't just steal the truck while the kid was outside. He had to make sure that the kid died. I guess this Halloween evil isn't practical. Also, a movie takes 31 minutes to Halloween. Did he escape? Asshole plays the pronoun game so that Officer Hawkins has to ask who the hell he is. I mean, I get that they didn't think the bus was going to crash and Myers would escape, but how about you not tempt fate by transferring the night before f***ing Halloween? As she sat combing her hair, unaware. Why are they taking these audio notes here at the graveyard? They know this story by memory. They aren't filming anything here. They aren't even saying anything specific about the cemetery. If you really wanted to get the feel of things and translate that to your podcast listeners, you'd do this at the old Myers house. But this could be done at the studio! Hey, good thing the people with Michael's mask are just hanging out at his sister's gravesite right as he's paying a visit. He continued stabbing. And as we sinned before and will sin again, he curiously looked up at the knife instead of the person he was stabbing. Oh, still checking IDs of the patients we recovered to figure out who's who. Holy sh! Omar J. Dorsey has clearly wandered off the set of another movie, and I'm pretty sure it's one I'd rather be watching. But hey, what are we gonna do? Castle Halloween? In the first Halloween, which is the only movie this one counts, the story is mental patient escapes, comes back to his hometown, and kills babysitters and their boyfriends on Halloween night, which was the anniversary of the night he killed his sister. That's all you need to cancel Halloween, and you can lose the snark as well. Teeth confetti! Conteethy? Let's face it, the only reason the podcasters existed in this movie was for exposition and to be murder fodder for Michael Myers so he could get his mask back. Did Lori take trapdoor building lessons from Ken Adam? Also good to know that when she really needs this shelter, it'll only take five hours for this kitchen island to rotate out of the way. You have no security system, Karen. Sure, Lori broke into their house to prove a point. I just don't know why she didn't just make a phone call and explain that Michael is on the loose first. And I'm not sure why she thought this would win Karen over. The bus crashed. What? Yeah, exactly. What? The bus crashed is as useful as the new Pitbull album is out. There's nothing you can do with that information. The world is not a dark and evil place. It is full of love and understanding. I mean, I get not every town has a Michael Myers, but the dark and evil place is pretty accurate. And also, this town does actually have a Michael Myers. So listen to your mom, maybe? Jesus Christ, how did Lori get here so fast? True, we don't know how much time has passed, but it feels like Lori's apparating into every scene. We saw her at her house playing with the trap door, then she broke into her daughter's house, and now she's here, all in a span of three minutes of movie time. Hey man, you were just at a gas station in an auto mechanic shop. You couldn't have picked up a weapon there? Or do you have rules about carrying weapons with you to your killing site? Just think, if this tool shed isn't left comically open during Halloween, then what? I don't have my stethoscope. I need it, I'm gonna get it. I'll be right back. You're not gonna believe that they were in my pocket the whole time. They meaning your stethoscope? You went back in to get a stethoscope and they were in your pocket the whole time? I am not for one minute going to believe that a woman that is this into Halloween isn't dressed up and doesn't have any decorations inside the place. She just carved 67 pumpkins and put them on the front porch, but otherwise she's not obsessed or anything. Also, while it's disturbing that Michael is killing a bunch of randos in this neighborhood, it's done with the least amount of suspense possible. It's a fun one shot and everything, but in the original Halloween, Michael seemed almost curious about who he was killing, creeping around in the shadows and the edges of the frame, his presence always felt even when he wasn't there. This is just murder porn. I'm so glad this movie that's supposed to be all about an older woman dealing with a traumatic past and conquering her fears found a way to have a wasted section with a bunch of teenagers doing dumb teenager He used to be my favorite, but now you're like my 10th favorite boy that I nanny. And I babysit some f***ing loser kids. If I had some other kind of babysitter, she'd be reading me a story. I wouldn't be up clipping my nasty ass toenails. Okay, while there's not enough of these two together, it doesn't change the fact that they're awesome and a welcome distraction. I'm feeling generous enough to knock off a sin for Vicky and Julia. She came up to me and like whispered in my ear, okay, you don't have to cry about it. Why is this scene? Tonight is the night. 
The one we'll remember for the rest of our lives. You are so getting dry tonight. So this movie is not only wasting Judy Greer, but apparently Virginia Gardner as well. I mean, Jesus, there are some good actors in this movie, which somehow makes it worse. <laughs> you checked behind the curtain? I checked the whole place. This kid knows that's a lie, because he watched her the whole time, and the curtains were in view. The rest of the time, she spent pulling the prank. Oh no, the closet door won't close. That's a closet's main function. It's right there, right in the word. Anyway, I'm sending this because does anybody remember what Hitchcock said about suspense? Something to the effect of, if you're having a conversation and a bomb blows up, that's a surprise. But if the audience knows there's a bomb while they're having a conversation, that's suspense. Somehow this scene invokes neither surprise nor suspense. So let's go back to this scene for a second. Dave starts up the motorbike creating a loud noise, which would make anyone who's ever seen a horror movie realize when Vicky calls for Dave, he won't hear her. However, he's already tipped the bike over and can hear her perfectly fine. So why'd the movie even bother with that if the noise wasn't ever going to be a factor? It would have been classic horror movie trope nonsense, but goddammit, it's our kind of horror movie trope nonsense. Movie wants us to believe that Michael recognizes Laurie, a random babysitter he stalked one night 40 years ago. Halloween purists can call the plot twist dumb all they want, but do you know the only way this scene works? He's her f***ing brother and Halloween 2 actually f***ing happened! Michael! Did you not see him go down the stairs? You're just gonna fire shots from this room at this angle. Also, why the f*** is he still here? He went through all this trouble to stage the bodies and then just camped out at the house. There's nothing inherently special about the people he just killed other than their secondary characters in this movie. They're no more special than the two women he killed before this. This is really one of those, the movie needed it, so this happened moments. I'm Michael's doctor, Ramir Sartain. You're the new Loomis. I love how this movie just throws Sam Loomis' name around like everyone knows who that is. Like there are people out there that would use that name for a f***ing Twitter handle or something. Did you know our friend Hawkins here? was the first responding deputy when Michael was apprehended in 1978. I mean, she was literally there that night, so most likely. Do you know that I pray every night that he would escape? That sounds insane. Sounds like you have a reason for that. Why would you just stop before giving the reason? You see, this is what has intrigued me through my studies. How does a crime like Michael's affect him? That is really interesting. What are you doing? You deserve better. Mm -hmm. This character didn't need to happen. Also, you know, if it got rid of all this teenage drama nonsense that even the CW wouldn't touch, it would almost be a mediocre film. Their beautiful bodies got me all chubbed out, Allison. Just want to point out that Vicky and Dave had to die before this squad. I'm a doctor. Lock your doors. <laughs> that would make about as much sense as me saying, I'm a dick on YouTube. Make sure you eat a sandwich. All right, pick your poison. I like a revolver. They never jam. That's 100% not true. The cylinder gaps can get blocked and prevent the cylinder from rotating and or the axle can and begin to unthread as you shoot, just to name a couple things. This is tactical. He waited for this night. He's waited for me. Interesting. So what was all that other killing that had nothing to do with you at all about then? Here we go. Brace yourselves. I'm just about to run this mother down with these two civilians in the car because what are we gonna do? Cancel Halloween? <laughs> Get away from the body. Stand back. I'm not gonna say it again. Step away from the suspect. Step away. Yeah! Man, just the stupid twist so hard. And yet again, we're killing off the most interesting characters in the movie. Also, this twist is way more interesting if we get to know his character better. If he had truly been the new Loomis, he could have been pretending to help everybody like Loomis did, only to spring a trap on them in the end. Lori would have been smart enough to figure it out because she's been training for this night for 40 years, but this comes sort of out of nowhere because he spent most of the movie's time recovering from a gunshot wound. That he's the secondary antagonist kind of makes me shrug. As the multiple edits with dark photography and close-ups suggest, the doctor, who is currently wearing the mask, just lifted Michael into the back seat of this truck. And knowing how big Michael is, I'm going to go ahead and say I don't believe he has the strength to do that. Now, a banh mi sandwich. Banh mi is essentially just the Vietnamese version of a French baguette. Mm -hmm. And the term actually refers to the bread and not so much the contents therein. This is some very nice Tarantino-esque dialogue in a Halloween movie, but I'm gonna go ahead and say movie has time for this, mainly because it's one of the only instances where they try to fit this kind of dialogue into the movie. Running, running, running. Excitement? Okay, supposedly Michael drives a cop car to Lori's place, and in the time it takes Ray to walk outside, he manages to get out of the car without being seen and stage a murder scene, where he's turned one of the cop's heads into a jack-o'-lantern. And I'm saying that the speed at which he did this, plus the know-how, is more terrifying than the act itself. Do you know how long it takes to hollow out a human head for this purpose? Like, a super long time. I could barely get through half of the job, or... I mean, I've never done anything like that before in my life, so what do I know? Also, how did Michael drive in here without going to the gate first? The podcasters came here and had to talk to Lori through an intercom before being allowed access. And I feel like Lori's the type of person who would have an alarm set if the fence was breached. She's also the type that would see a cop car and still ask the driver questions before allowing them in. 
How? This movie seems to forget the podcasters were here and that we saw a giant cage door in front of the main door. We should be seeing some part of that cage coming through the glass at the very least. How did he punch through that and the glass? If he's that strong, he should have just battle ran the door down. Also, unless Michael can contort his body to be as thin as the middle section of that door, there is no way Lori couldn't see he was there when she looked out the window. Also, also, the f*** is Lori just standing in front of the door for? She has trained for this, and I am certain staying away from doors and windows is part of that. Wow, Lori looks remarkably unharmed and without concussions after taking several severe blows to the head. I was wrong to raise you the way I did, but at least I can protect you. Last minute parenting. Yep, it's your grandmother's shooting range. It's not all that scary. Maybe just to you, but the audience saw this in the daylight, and it simply does not matter. No way. After Lori shot Michael's fingers off, she went down into the shelter and turned on all the lights outside. The camera was very particular about showing Ray's body there. Not long after, we saw Michael sans two fingers and a thumb standing in the kitchen with nobody in sight. Lori tried shooting at him from down in the basement and then immediately walked upstairs to confront him. He did not have the means or time or even two hands to be able to pick up Ray and display him in an upstairs closet without being seen or hurt. I don't understand at this point why Lori doesn't just turn on a Light. In fact, while it made sense at first to turn off all the lights before he got here, I now wonder what the wisdom was of that, considering that he's a pure evil entity where lights or lack thereof shouldn't even be an issue for him. I'm not saying a woman in her late 50s fighting a man in his early 60s can't be exciting, but I am saying the scene of a woman in her late 50s fighting a man in his early 60s is not exciting. See, this is cool because she was looking down on him in the first Halloween, except it actually wasn't her, it was Loomis. But he's dead, so now I have to do the reversal with her, and I need to change my shorts. So now I'm wondering how Michael got back down here after Lori went upstairs and methodically locked down everywhere she went so that he couldn't follow her. And yes, maybe he just figured out how to work those security doors, but we never heard the door go back up, and those suckers are loud. Maybe it's one of the nitpickiest nitpicks that I have ever knitted, but I feel it's important to point out for some reason because I'm being a super dick. Okay. Okay. Not okay. Why are you f***ing saying anything? I can't do it. I'm sorry. I can't do it. Gotcha. <laughs> Gotta say, that was cool. I mean, probably too little too late. Sure, have a sim back. Happy Halloween, Michael. Laurie, this is bad form. You know goddamn well this knife isn't going to work. And besides, probably November 1st and not even Halloween anymore, and I can't let that slide. Allison has a knife here, but six seconds later, she's looking for the knife, which is way over here. It's not a cage, baby. It's a trap. Yeah, sounds like this was the plan all along. Find a way to push Michael down into a basement where there are no exits other than the entrance and somehow get past him. Subdue him and trap him. This is a terrible plan. All that time you spent making this when you could have just lured him down here more conventionally, created better exits to get out and trap him, and not scheming something where almost dying is part of the plan. I guess you've practiced this enough to know that the house won't explode while you sit there staring at Michael and get in your three-generation group hug. How many houses have you blown up? At the end of this movie, Lori and her family are in some dude's truck going to get help. But didn't Lori have her own car? Or did she decide, eh, if I'm ever in a situation where I can take down Michael, my car needs to blow up with the house too. 56 seconds of logos and also Comcast. Halloween sequel picks up right where it left off. Uh, if you guys are together, let me know. If the call went to voicemail, how are we hearing Cameron's voice on Oscar's phone? Ah! Dude, this movie began with you on a cell phone trying to call your dead asshole friend from the first movie. Cell phones can be used to dial 911, also known as the help you are stupidly trying to get by yelling it out loud. <laughs> Going to go ahead and retroactively add a sin for Sheriff Hawkins surviving his attack in the first film. In fact, it's so much bullshit that he did survive, I'm going to retroactively add 10. He needs to die. Side effects of neck stabbing include playing the pronoun game. Michael somehow disappears after he A, unlocked a fence, went through it, and locked it back before Hawkins got there, B, went through an already open fence and took the time to lock it after he went through, or C, just scaled that motherfucker and jumped over it. And quite honestly, showing me how Michael did this would have been way more entertaining for me than wondering how he did this. My mom used to make me go over to his house to play. She felt bad but he would just spend the whole time staring out of his sister's bedroom window. I'm just trying to imagine the scenario where you go over to the Myers house and ask, can Michael come out and play? And their answer is, well, no, but you can go up to his sister's room while he stares outside her window. Or wait, did you just play in the front yard alone while Michael stayed inside? That's what you get when you f with the Mulaney's. I'm sorry, is this supposed to be the origin story of the O'Doyle family from Billy Madison? Or is this an entirely different group of redheaded assholes that yell out their family name to tout their greatness? You kids see anyone walking around in a white mask? 
It's Halloween. This cop gets the sarcastic answer that he deserves, but even after that, he never tries to give any other descriptors like height, weight, clothing, or anything else that might jog these kids' memories. All right, take it easy. Where'd he go? What do you mean, where'd he go? He's f***ing right there, standing over Lonnie. They would have seen him on their approach, probably no matter which direction they were coming from. It's a matter of about six seconds between Lonnie lying down, covering his face, and these two Haddonfield police officers showing up. This guy just forgets to be a cop when he's wandering through the old Myers house, even though he and Hawkins heard a commotion up here just seconds ago. Okay. Hawkins hears the struggle and is literally 10 feet away, but it takes him approximately 10 hours, 27 minutes, and 78 seconds to run over to the next room. Why is Michael leaving without killing Hawkins? Does Michael know he needs future Hawkins to add a little more gravitas to his killing spree when he escapes in 40 years? This is the second time Michael Myers has stood outside his house after a tragic death, and it's the second instance in which everyone just stands for an uncomfortable amount of time while a camera they don't know is there tries to build up to the dramatic title reveal. Opening credits for a Halloween film are long as f and show an image of a jack-o'-lantern cliche. All the s*** happening today. Two homicides at gas station. Stop it. We don't even know if he was on the bus. Tommy, you're so paranoid. Lonnie and Mary interacting like Tommy's concerns are silly, but a prison bus wrecked that may or may not have had Michael f***ing Myers on it. And a couple people have turned up dead afterwards. There will be plenty to send Tommy about later, but his friends are just being assholes. They are friends with that crazy lady that almost got killed by Mike Myers. And I'm your expositional bartender. When you can't get that exposition to come in any other way, don't hesitate to call. That's 1-800-BAR-SINCE. Uh, Lonnie, put me up to this Legacy sequel to a movie that was already a legacy sequel and introducing more legacy characters to the legacy sequel that is a legacy sequel to another legacy sequel. They had sightings of a, a ghost-like figure creeping right through our town. No one will be seated during the Dead Zone tells the story of the original Halloween scene. And we have Miss Mary in Chambers. She survived an assault. Some of you may remember she died in Halloween H2O, but history is written by the victors. Oh, no, no. Yes, it's rather tragic that the firefighters are going to do their job and put out the fire, but if Michael Myers hasn't burned to death by now, that fire was never going to work anyway. Wait a f***ing second. Are you telling me there was a little security door leading to a tiny room and Michael was just chilling inside it this whole time? Does anybody remember the last movie? Lori built her house specifically for killing Michael. She built this basement to trap his ass and burn him. So you're telling me that in the construction of this kill basement, she left a glaring weakness like this in the kill basement? <laughs> Holy shit, guys, it's happening. I'm finally getting a reason to use the saw. <laughs> oh, man. Bringing a water hose to a Michael Myers fight. These guys are incredible at fighting fires, but terrible at fighting Myers. Oh, great. Going to get another Halloween sequel that makes the mistake of sticking Jamie Lee Curtis in a hospital bed for the majority of the film. Lori. And if two former babysat brats, a nurse, and a rando child bully that had two scenes in the 1978 original film weren't enough for you, former Haddonfield Sheriff Lee Brackett is now on the premises to make sure all of your legacy sequel character quota is met. Movie will become an episode of ER for the next couple minutes, and not an exciting episode. Just a bunch of doctors having a muffled conversation so the movie can have a bunch of random and grotesque shots of surgery. It's Laurie Stroh's house on fire. From upstairs, it looks like they put it out. So I guess Michael stayed behind to put the fire out after he killed the firefighters? Also, how is this couple anywhere near Laurie to see her house? The first movie took great pains to show how far out in the sticks Laurie lived, and there didn't appear to be another house around for miles. Cheap piece of sh and the drone could very well be a cheap piece of shit, but that's not why it crashed into the wall. It crashed into the wall, Sandra, because you steered it into the wall. Let's put the blame where the blame lies, Sandra. I'm not entirely sure why Michael felt the need to hide out in the bathroom after icing an entire battalion of firefighters. But then again, maybe he needed the privacy to masturbate. Or he needed to mix up that medicine using drywall and mirror shards from Predator 2. I really don't know. Even for a door in a horror film has a bunch of ridiculous locks on it cliche, this particular door is a little out of hand. It has a chain and a deadbolt on this door? Michael's kind of a killing genius, isn't he? I mean, this poor lady has no chance at killing him, and he can probably find knives in this kitchen if he looks in the usual places, but no. He looks at a fluorescent bulb and says, you know what? I can break that, and that will become a stabbing weapon. Mike sticks multiple knives in this guy, and I guess he's trying to get a submission into the Museum of Modern Art or something. Since when is this guy into arts and crafts? I mean, in Halloween 2, he was more of an art critic, but Halloween 2 doesn't count this series anyway. I think I'll break off with my girlfriend. Haddonfield Halloween talent show has to be the only talent show where the audience members are relieved when there is some murder news because then they no longer have to willingly submit to whatever this is. I've been having a ball about 50 years. Oh, he has time for this. Fugitive is on foot. His name is Michael Myers. Go get him. Larry, that's a good attempt at the Tommy Lee Jones speech from The Fugitive, but you forgot all the stuff about the average foot speed and searching out houses and hen houses. Let's take it from the top. Uh, two patients of the local Smiths Grove State Hospital unaccounted for after yesterday's transport bus escape. The movie makes sure to rack focus this sh so that it blurs out the human Michael Myers on TV. And, like, I get it, but 
It makes us think that seeing the back of Tommy Doyle's f***ing head is the most important thing to see in this shot. Authorities have not confirmed a connection between those two events. Yeah, but how has the media not made a connection yet? Did you not just show Michael on the screen a second ago? The story of Michael Myers being transferred from Smith's Grove should have been huge news considering right after this, the reporter reminds people of the stuff that happened on Halloween night in 1978. Also, it's kind of weird that none of these legacy characters knew about Michael getting released from Smith Grove. Seems like they would have known about this extraordinary circumstance of Michael getting transferred after 40 years, but apparently they didn't. That's Julian. That's the little last one kid from across the street. Halloween Kills takes the character of Julian, one of the only interesting characters from the previous film, and turns him into that little asshole kid from across the street. And yes, I am happy as a clam to see guy who didn't realize his stethoscope was in his pants from the last film get promoted all the way to supporting character with a name in this film because he's Marcus and we like Marcus fine, but he's no Julian. You're no Julian, Marcus. Do you hear me? Shit, I forgot my stethoscope. It's too bad Marcus doesn't make it to Halloween ends. Could have had a trilogy of him forgetting his stethoscope. <laughs> a non-Michael Myers patient who escaped just happens to show up to this bar where survivors from the first Halloween just happen to be so that the mistaken identity shenanigans can begin. Mommy, what are you doing? Clearly he's going behind Brian's bar and grabbing Brian's bat while neither asking for or receiving Brian's consent. F Tommy. Love lives today. But evil dies tonight. You had that one queued up and ready to go all night, didn't you, Marion? What if Tommy had never set you up with the Love Lives Today opener? Anthony Michael Hall in The Breakfast Club. Person who just wrecked their car has made an impossibly quick exit when people run to investigate a cliche. Oh, sh JFK's about to die. We rip his mask off, look him in the eye. Swing off Huckleberry here. Say night night. Tommy was just waiting for that one moment where his face basked in the glow of red brake light would give him the perfect visual cue to delivering these words he had been longing to say since Halloween night 40 years ago. She's still alive, call 911! This is all a prank by three kids so that they can steal these guys' candy. But it would have been awesome if while this girl was setting the trap, Michael Myers had come by and killed her friend lying on the sidewalk. Then this wouldn't be such a monumental waste of fing time. We're not even scared. Kids. Do hospitals usually allow visitors to walk around in blood-drenched clothing in the hallways? Wouldn't they tell Allison to get a fresh set of clothes or something? This isn't sanitary, right? Apparently Michael's doctor's place of death was in Turkey? What? Allison, 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 are you okay? How did Cameron know that was her from all the way out there? Did someone tell him that Allison and her family were at the hospital? Also, why is Cameron even here? He called his dad to come pick him up at the park near his school, which is exactly why his dad left the bar earlier. Did he need him to come out just so his dad could take him to the hospital for whatever dumbass reason? Oh Previously on the third first Halloween. How about this sassy tackle? Checking your gun inventory while in a hospital parking lot. Do you have a permit for all these? Ha, movie expects us to believe that Tommy says sinister shit in the bask of red tail light glow Doyle would be concerned about whether or not Lonnie's guns were legally procured. Close friends of ours and we just want to help out. I'm a doctor and my husband's a nurse. Being a part of the medical profession is great. On a night where all these people are getting hurt or killed, you should maybe work at the hospital instead. Michael Myers has haunted this town for 40 years. Not really though. I think we talked about this in the last Halloween, but if you remove all the other Halloweens after it, then you just have a night where a dude killed a couple babysitters and their boyfriends. Since there haven't been any Myers sightings for 40 years, this haunting nonsense is kind of bullshit. Isn't it? I need some good people. People aren't afraid to get their hands dirty. Everybody else needs to go home. There were this many people who responded to Tommy Doyle when he said he needed people who weren't afraid to get their hands dirty at a fucking gas station, which is surprisingly hopping on Halloween night after all the murder news. Now listen, boys, there's strength in numbers. But don't tell that to the 11 firefighters who just got their asses destroyed. They're unavailable for comment. Careful, Lindsay. Lindsay, how Stay. would you go? Lindsay. You gonna kill me? <laughs> Satan, not today. These kids haven't died yet. And like, there's a creepy man in a white mask, and he keeps like trying to play hide and seek with us. Wow, so Lindsay's wrecking crew just happened to stop in the one place where Michael Myers just happens to be at this very moment. Depending on what the movie wants you to think in any given moment, Haddonfield is either a small town where everything is really close to each other, or it's large enough to have its own news station. It's Michael! Marion not only gets attacked by Michael for a second time in this timeline, but also both times are when she's in a car. Those are the kind of stats that scream, find a nice house in a nice part of town where all the necessities are within walking distance and never even f***ing look at a car again. Michael grabs Marion's hair and as he thrusts her head towards the door, a sudden other hand shows up that is definitely not Michael's. And it's not her hand because she's not wearing these cuffs. And it's definitely not the nurse or the doctor's hands. Hey Michael, this is for Dr. Loomis. But Michael didn't kill Dr. Loomis. And what's with all this one for Dr. Loomis bullshit anyway? This timeline's Dr. Loomis didn't have to deal with Michael escaping all those times and leaving so many trails of dead bodies because Loomis only had to deal with one Michael Myers escape. This idea that Dr. Loomis was still all tortured and shit, along with no one in the medical field believing him, doesn't even make sense anymore.
to be fair, the exact same thing that's going to happen to Marion would have happened even if the gun had fired. Even Michael is tired of this running gag with a stethoscope. Ah! Is it just me or did these characters deserve better? If you're gonna get people who were day players in the first movie and call them back to have bigger roles in the sequel, don't they deserve not to die like chumps? Having yet another version of this fucking head tilt in every one of these movies. It was super effective the first time and it becomes less effective every time you pay homage to it. We're over the head tilt, people. Took Lindsay a long time to get over here with this bag of bricks. Seems like she could have been over here before he killed all three people in the car. At the very least, that should have been the goal. God, they just leave your bloody shirt just sitting here? Listen here, Karen. I've already talked about how this hospital let your daughter walk around with a bloody shirt a minute ago. I have already sinned the safety standards of this hospital, so stop trying to steal my thunder. We burned him to the goddamn ground. Why are you so sure? At the beginning of the movie, you were certain the firefighters were gonna fuck all that up. Lindsay's car. It's covered in blood. There's no bodies. It's Michael. He's here. Clearly he was here, but you would have no way of knowing he was still there, Tommy. Your heart is in the right place, but I question your leadership skills. Come on, I need you guys, come on. Maybe you need Lonnie if he's dumb enough to stay out here, but I don't understand putting Lonnie's son or Lori's granddaughter in harm's way. We're supposed to like Tommy and Lonnie, right? So let me get this straight. After killing Marion, Marcus, and Vanessa, Lindsay attacked Michael and then ran away into the woods where he tried to track her down. He obviously didn't find her, so Michael then decided to go back to the murder scene and arrange Marcus and Vanessa horror movie style on this merry-go-round. Fucking why? Do you remember that night at the bar? I kissed you, but I knew you were sweet friend. Ben Tramer. Since Lori was in high school and she liked Ben Tramer, I'm uncomfortable hearing about this cop kissing her in a bar around that time. Sure, she could have carried a torch for Ben Tramer for a long time after the first Halloween, but this is the kind of reference that immediately smells of bullshit, where you introduce some new character who's in love with a legacy character and then try to shoehorn a reference to the old movie at the same time, and it just doesn't add up. You know, when we were kids, we used to all dare each other to sneak into the old Myers house. Why is more time being spent on reminiscing and not enough time being spent on getting Lindsay to the goddamn hospital? The boogeyman is at large. He's got no choice but to emerge. I would like to send the idea that anyone would listen to a guy raving about boogeyman and this is our night, but then I live in America, so... <sighs> Also, I might have missed the part where Tommy Doyle was elected representative kick-ass in the Haddonfield election. This guy starts speechifying in front of all the cops in this hospital as if he's got some grand authority in this town. And why? Because he survived Michael Myers when he was a kid 40 years ago? We had him. How did he escape? I don't know. Maybe this is the time you think about how you constructed a room in your basement where Michael could hide behind a metal door while the fire raged. What do we do? We don't have the police support. We fight. We always fight. Yeah, you know we fight. Like all the other times Michael ever appeared before tonight. Like in Halloween's 2 through 6 and H2O and the Rob Zombie versions. And even that one with Buster Rhymes in it. You know, if those were canon anymore. I don't even know why I brought them up. Anyway, who wants to fight? I want to fight. There's a system. Well, the system failed. To be fair, the last part of the previous film and the entirety of this movie have taken place over maybe a couple hours real time. And while the system probably will fail you, because it's a horror movie, I don't really think the system has ever been given enough time to fail. Oh, so they just kept that painkiller out in the open for anyone to grab and use whenever they wanted. Cool. It's not like there's an opioid crisis or anything. You and Allison should not have to keep running because of the darkness that I created on Oh, 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 Lori. Someone thinks a little too much of themselves, don't they? You created this darkness. How do you figure? I mean, yeah, you royally f***ed up your Michael Myers kill house, but that's hardly creating darkness. <laughs> I thought Allison might have wiped this knife off when she gave it to her grandmother, but no. She kept it properly bloodstained. Watching a John Cassavetes film on Halloween night. I'll handle it. The truly incredible thing in this movie is how Michael Myers is on the loose and no one's told the people who own this old house about it at all. Not even Anthony Michael Brawl has come by here to warn those guys. Well, now they're at the front door. Michael apparently knocked on the back door and then ran around the house to the front door only to come back around to the back door when little John leaves it open and I can't imagine a shot or series of shots I would have liked to have seen more in this movie. This is a shot of little John standing in front of the stairs. In a moment, we're gonna find out that Michael went up them. And somehow, little John didn't hear that shit. Next time I'm coming with a pitchfork. Or there's a 50% chance that I'm letting you in on the fact that this is a working pitchfork. It's really anyone's guess on who that admission will end up benefiting. Why did Michael knock the trash can over and how come neither of the Johns heard it? I got this knife. 
I got this knife. Or, and bear with me here, you could just run out of the house and call the cops. You don't have the same disadvantage everyone else has had in these movies. Michael is upstairs. He spared your lives. You can leave. Yeah, sure, lock the door now that you know someone left a giant bloody handprint in your house. Is that you? No, of course it isn't, but all these assholes will think the other escaped inmate is Michael for way too long of a period of time. And let's not even get into the massive convenience of the inmate showing up at this very moment when there are more than enough people to form a hellbent mob. <laughs> I keep thinking about that stupid news broadcast earlier that showed what the two escape patients look like, but didn't put out their names or anything. These people would know this isn't Michael Myers. Honestly, they should know this guy isn't him anyway, since Michael is super tall and even after 40 years wouldn't look like this. Stories of Michael's stature would be well known. It's also pretty incredible that over the years, regular photographs of Michael Myers weren't available, considering the public interest in his story. I mean, he's walking pretty slowly. Probably could try and run. <laughs> or he's just gonna stand there and scream, I guess. Good call. Let me know how that turns out for you. Of all the people running through this hallway, Lori picks the doctor, who might have actually needed to check on a patient and wasn't looking for vigilante justice. Do morgues have open windows so anybody can see the daily selection of corpses on view? Hospital staff sightings on the second floor. Why are you relaying this info to Karen instead of getting up to the second floor and handling it yourself? Michael's masterpiece. He created this chaos, but I'm the one that brought it all onto Haddonfield. Yes, I'm sure Michael had the foresight of the stupidity of mass mob culture and made sure to time out his escape and killing spree to match up with the timeline of this knowledge. I saw the look in Loomis's eyes. Yes, they did a pretty great job with all the prosthetics, but you can never make the eyes look just right. In this story, Officer Hawkins, the rookie cop, is the only one who tries to stop Loomis from killing Michael. All the other cops just stand around and I guess they were okay with Hawkins doing this? Actually, they seem pretty indifferent to whatever happens. They seem really more like wallpaper for this scene. Who knows what these cops want? I really can't blame the filmmakers for trying to do something different, but I think the previous movie needed to set up Haddonfield's fears of Michael Myers more than just Laurie's families. It needed more build-up to this evening. For 40 years, this has been a sleepy town where nothing happens, and now suddenly it's a powder keg. Now he's turning us into monsters. The movie presents its thesis like a teacher's pet strolling in the classroom with a laminated report, a fruit basket, and several of Eddie Haskell's all-time kiss-ass lines. He's going home. He went from Lori's compound mm -hmm. to victims in her neighborhood to the park. Okay, if you track those locations, that's a straight line. Guess I'll take your word for it, even though that sounds like a dubious set of data points to create a straight line. Anyway, my question is, why hasn't anyone thought about Michael's house sooner? Motherfucker went to the old house in the original film, too, and came back to it the same night, according to this movie's flashbacks. I came face to face with this asshole when I was a kid. He creeps, he kills, he goes home. He came face to face with him briefly and he disappeared. He didn't do any of the other things you just mentioned in that one moment, so I don't know how that makes you an expert. Now I'm going in alone. I totally understand the instinct to protect the kids here, but I don't understand the I'm going to go in alone mentality. Do people hear what happened in these news stories? Michael killed an entire group of firefighters. Sam Loomis shot the guy six times back in 1978. What skills do these people possess that make them think they can take on someone like that by themselves? Knocking on the door to see if a killer is home. I just realized this is the second Halloween sequel that has forced a woman to partner up with her slimy, cheating boyfriend to face Michael Myers. That's a weird trope to come back to, but you do you, Halloween kills. This movie has around 13 minutes left, and it feels like at least 11 of them are spent on Allison and Cameron staring at this door. Either Michael put a decoy pumpkin in the closet, or the Johns did that for their own f***ed up reason. By the way, there's a bullshit pumpkin in a bullshit closet creating a bullshit fake scare, and it's just all the bullshit. Once again, a character gets distracted and stops being alert while they're wandering around the f***ing Myers house. Unfortunately for Allison, these murders weren't related to Michael Myers at all, and the police found her fingerprints on the knife, and she got 30 to life for killing these guys. <laughs> How the f*** did Michael get the body up there and position it in such a way to create this diversion? Even if the ladder was already extended to the ground, Michael would have had to kill Lonnie, drape him across the ladder, then push that ladder with his body on it, and somehow keep it stuck there while folding the ladder and closing the attic door. Feels like a bit of a waste taking the time to pull that knife out of yourself and then just tossing it aside. Cameron survives this longer than he should. What the f***? Did Allison call her mom at some point during this to tell her where she was going to be? And later we find out Karen brought the mob with her, so if Allison did tell her what was going on, why didn't she tell Lonnie before he got murdered and stuffed in the attic? One question, why pull the rake out? And another question, why not stab him again? I mean, this is one of the worst won't be needing this anymore since I've ever witnessed. Even if you're eventually luring him to a mob later, why proceed with a stomp down instead of more stabbing? You want your mask? I'm coming! 
fucking get it! This, his association with the mask makes him more evil bullshit conjured up by the podcasters in the previous film reeks its way into this installment as well. Karen is luring Michael one street over, where the posse has assembled to take Michael down once and for all. But this plan required the exact scenario presented by the movie to work. It required Allison to fall down the stairs and for Karen to be outside the front door when Michael tried to kill Allison again. Also, this is a fucking stupid plan that relies on Karen being able to outrun a seasoned serial killer that very well could have some supernatural energy surging through him. For a few blocks, why wouldn't they have everyone on the street where the Myers house is ready to ambush Michael? Gotcha. Is this supposed to arouse my applause boner? You said gotcha in the last movie and you saw how that turned out. Maybe you should stop with the premature celebration until a doctor confirms a flatline. Also, after the bloodthirsty mob killed that innocent guy that Karen felt bad about, who exactly did she trust to tag along on this mob killing? How did they round this group up in time? Hey Michael, it's Halloween. Everyone's entitled to one good scare. The former Sheriff Brackett wastes his 1978 callback to a character he never spoke this line to. In the original Halloween, Lee said this line to Lori. This asshole brought a hockey stick, and this guy a board, and this woman brought an iron. She brought a fucking iron, ladies and gentlemen. Why does everyone in the movie get to see what Michael looks like but we don't? Also, the mob gives Michael time to put his mask back on for... I have no fucking clue why they did that. Attack him! I always thought Michael Myers was flesh and blood, just like you and me. You can't defeat it with brute force. And I'd call my daughter to tell her my hypothesis while Haddonfield tries to kill Michael, but nah. As we watch Michael murder everyone because he's an indestructible killing machine, I'm wondering why the mob has gone with the one-on-one -on -one approach rather than gang tackling him to the ground and maybe putting some handcuffs on him. If a woman brought an iron, someone brought handcuffs. Hell, the dead cop has some handcuffs, right? Also, maybe the cops got their feelings hurt when Tommy told them off earlier, but I still can't believe the goddamn cops haven't shown up yet. I mean, paramedics are at the Myers house. Someone called 911. We see cops there. They just let the mob justice run its course. Karen is allowed to walk around alone in a house that is currently a crime scene. Also, is there any actual reason for Karen to walk up these steps and enter Michael's bedroom other than for him to magically show up and kill her at the end of this movie? What's she so goddamn curious about? The window Michael used to look out? Who gives a sh**? Movie kills Judy Greer, even though she's awesome. And while I don't know for a fact yet that she survives this, even suggesting that she might not be in the third movie is some bullshit. Also, Michael killed the entire mob and made it back to his house unseen and upstairs to kill Karen. I'm Willie the Kid and there's nothing you can do about it. The beginning of Halloween the 13th is not Michael Myers killing this radio DJ. Also, Comcast. Also, 52 seconds of logos. In case you confused it with Haddonfield, Virginia. There are three of them living in this house and they have this many goddamn stairs. I don't know if that's a sin or not, but it should be. Jeremy! Jeremy. I'm gonna put the candy on the porch. Trick-or-treat kids can help themselves. Trusting trick-or-treaters not to empty the entire bowl and thus forcing the hand of future trick-or-treaters to egg and TP your house relentlessly. Since last Halloween, all the events and, you know, the headlines of Michael Myers. So wait, are you telling me that Haddonfield still has a robust amount of trick-or-treaters the very next year? Michael Myers wasn't even caught or killed in 2018, despite the tremendous efforts of Anthony Michael Hall, and his murders are well documented to occur on Halloween. What the f***? are kids doing out trick-or-treating the very next year. This babysitter isn't going to jail for showing his thing to kids. Also, showing John Carpenter's The Thing is a fun homage to the kids watching the original The Thing in the 1978 Halloween. But it also just makes me want to go watch this movie instead of the rest of Halloween ends. No, you're scared. I'm 21 years old, I don't get scared. Yeah, there's nothing to be scared about at 21. Just, you know, figuring out what you're gonna do with the rest of your life, learning about taxes, hoping that condom breaking didn't make you a 21-year-old father. You know, nothing scary. Okay, that's actually pretty disgusting and probably not appropriate for kids. This scene they're watching in The Thing comes in around one hour and 15 minutes into the movie. And while it's probably the grossest part, you've already seen more than enough gore and ickiness to make this determination well before this point. And I don't really feel like pretend- Kids leaving zucchini bread out like this. Do you want stale zucchini bread? Because this is how you get stale zucchini bread. And ants. This isn't funny, Jeremy. Real life interaction with CinemaSins commenters makes it into the movie. I don't blame Corey for exercising caution here, but I do blame him for taking a methodical horror movie pace up the stairs when Jeremy yells like this. Cut! Movie will try to make you believe that when Corey kicked this door, that he was able to supply enough force to jettison Jeremy over this railing and fall to his death. But I carefully examined the height of this railing and its distance from the door before Corey even walked into the room, and I've determined that there is no way any such thing could possibly happen. So there. Surprise! This movie doesn't start with a Michael Myers killing, it starts with a good old fashioned prank gone wrong death perpetrated by an asshole kid, his gullible babysitter, and a faulty floor plan. That's the way to subvert audience expectations, by completely taking Michael Myers out of the equation! It worked for Halloween 3 Season of the Witch, it'll be a tremendous success for this third Halloween movie. What happened to 
Accusing your 21-year-old babysitter who's holding a knife and said, I'm going to kill you, Jeremy, just as you walked in the door of wrongdoing. Squash on squash, squashing. It took four riders to come up with a way for Halloween to end. Huddenfield was a peaceful town. And then one Halloween night many years ago, all of that was lost. Wait, are you talking about the night Michael killed his sister? Or are you talking about the night 15 years later after he broke out of Smith's Grove? And how could either of those incidents be the moment where all was lost? Did Haddonfield become a hotbed of murder in the 40 years after Michael was sent back? The movie's about to make a point that Haddonfield has become a violent place since 2018 when Michael escaped and went on a rampage, which makes a whole lot more sense than pinning it on either 1963 or 1978. Michael Myers was pure evil. He took our dreams and turned them into nightmares. <laughs> movie confuses Michael Myers with Freddy Krueger. And Haddonfield was once again forced to confront this man in a mask. A Friday the 13th style killing recap in a Halloween film. Friday the 13th was supposed to have stolen from you, Halloween franchise, not the other way around. Although if Michael Myers goes to Manhattan in the next film, I won't be upset. His senseless brutality ravaged my community and killed my daughter. Just going to go ahead and sin this f***ing franchise again for killing off Judy Greer. And then he vanished. This is a big part of this movie's mythology, that Michael Myers just quit getting a murder boner on his favorite holiday for the next four years. It never gives any kind of explanation as to why this is occurring. We're just supposed to roll with it, and I will not be rolling with it. There isn't anything inherently wrong with these newspaper articles for once, but I do find it curious that all of them were written by some anonymous staff writer. Industrial grinder foreshadowing. It's my 110th least favorite kind of foreshadowing. It's just below mystery meat foreshadowing and right above ant farm foreshadowing. Hey, Corey, you're late. You're late again. I am sure Corey's lateness will be a devastating plot point on which this entire movie plot will rest. This boogeyman has been sitting in hibernation, but trust me, y'all, he'll be back. If Willie the Kid is the late night DJ for WURG 94.9, then why is he broadcasting in what is clearly the morning? Camera pans over to show us an ominous sewer tunnel, where I guess Michael Myers has been spending his days cosplaying as Pennywise. Or in the f***ing marching band. <laughs> this line possesses swagger that no one who has ever been in a marching band possesses. Corey gets a measure of revenge by slashing the bully kid's tires, but he doesn't even stay around at a distance to witness his reaction, which is the best part of slashing someone's tires. Er, so I'm told. This gentleman had an accident and needs a little fix up. Jesus Christ, Allison has some of the most immediate I want to bone you eyes that have ever immediated, all from a side profile of the guy her eyes want to bone. You shouldn't let that guy talk to you like that. It's gonna make you sad even if you don't think it does. Mansplaining toxic masculinity. You know, you need to find someone that can let go, that makes you want to rip off your shirt and show grief your fucking tits and say, you know what, let's go. My parents didn't name me grief as a child. How much fucking marinara do you have to have all over your mouth to get this much on your glass of milk? Do napkins not exist in Haddonfield? Also, drinking milk with Italian food. Who's that person you're texting? Movie spends entirely too much time on Corey and Allison's burgeoning romance, but not enough ending the Halloween. Boys who keep secrets don't get custard for dessert. F you, Joan, that's not how it goes. It's, if you don't eat your meat, you can't have any pudding. How can you have any pudding if you don't eat your meat? Stand still, laddie. There might be more appearances and Halloween ends of this industrial grinder than there are appearances of Michael Myers. I'm sorry to buy you this sh My goddamn son drove three miles on a fucking flat. How are you bothering the auto shop guy with fixing a car when that's his exact business? It's like the movie wanted to continue the theme of people being shitty to people and every chance that characters get, they throw extra needles into the needling, like Terry's dad does here. This movie really wants to be Stephen King's It, from a sewer-dwelling Michael who hasn't resurfaced for a few years right down to the mysterious brain worms infecting the people of the town that have been awakened by his presence. My niece gave me a Rosetta Stone and now I'm learning Japanese. Shatsu o Nakoshita. What's that mean? I believe it is Japanese for skip. The store is seriously understocked in the Diet Dr. Pepper department and that is some terrible stocking priorities. Do you see what he did to my sister? I'm sorry, there is absolutely no way this woman is alive. Michael smashed a fluorescent bulb and stuck the sharp end directly into her neck. I don't know how you stop that kind of blood loss or get medical attention in time, especially since she lived in the same boondocks where Lori lived. You were her neighbor? And you don't even know her name, do you? Giving shit to a traumatized introvert for being an introvert. You tempted and you provoked that man when you should have left him alone. Is this honestly a narrative someone would come up with after the story of the mad doctor who idolized Michael set him free in the first movie? I guess it is, considering the movie's theme that everyone is a dickwad now. I would like to see those cherry blossoms. Requesting to see someone's cherry blossoms in a parking lot. This terrible dancing goes on for all the sometime. I know what it's like 
to have everybody looking at you thinking that they know you. Jesus Christ, man. Did this movie franchise just turn into Riverdale? The first ever Halloween wasn't big on lots of murders until the third act, but at least Michael showed up to stalk people and make his presence felt. There was a sense of danger in every frame of the movie. The only threat this movie poses is to put me to sleep. Corey! How the f*** did they know that was Corey from behind? There you are, man. I've been looking for you. Only in 2022 and beyond could people from the f***ing marching band be the lead bullies in a film. I'm not sure if that's a step forward or a step back. Nor do I care. I didn't push nobody. He fell. God damn it, are they actually attempting irony here? For f sake, man, I brought my kids to this. I don't want to have to explain irony to them. What's even more ludicrous than Michael having hung out in the sewer for the last four years is that he's still wearing his mask. Stand back, guys. This is where Michael chokes someone to death to read their mind and determine if they're worthy. McDonald's. You take people in there now and then. Why did he let you live? Because he had evil eyes, random homeless guy. Don't you know about the evil eyes? They've only been talking about the evil eyes in this franchise for the last 44 goddamn years. This asshole throws the murder weapon like his fingerprints won't give him away when they find this shit. You've been processed through the system, dude. Not expecting someone to be thinking rationally when they commit their second accidental murder, but I am asking them not to be stupid. Oh, f***ing what? Not even the current Michael Myers is that stealthy. The f*** did this f*** come from? I killed someone. That is the strangest way of saying I'm sorry that I've ever heard. Also, this works. They would have felt for him. They would have helped him heal. But because your boogeyman disappeared, they needed a new one. Man, the things this town keeps blaming Lori for keep getting more and more ridiculous. Has Joan seriously been blaming Lori for her son's troubles for the last four years? I guess people cope how they cope, but that doesn't make this forced conflict any less of an illogical leap. Also, I wonder if when John Carpenter and Deborah Hill were writing the Boogeyman dialogue for Tommy Doyle's character in the original Halloween, they were thinking, I bet Boogeyman becomes the most overused word in this franchise for the next 40 plus f***ing years. I'm sorry. That's it. She went to Corey's mother's house and blah, blah, nothing happens, blah. She gets basically the same lecture the lady in the grocery store parking lot gave her, and now she's leaving? The hell is the point of that sh Why not leave? Why stay? All my memories are here. You're right, Allison. Nobody who has memories in one place could possibly move somewhere else. I'm not afraid of these people. I'm not afraid anymore. As if Corey needed immediate proof of his new outlook, Allison's asshole ex-boyfriend just happens to show up drunk and somewhat aggressive so that Corey can confront him like he's Clark Kent in Superman 2. Just burn it all to the ground. I get that Allison might have some Bonnie and Clyde fantasy buried deep within. She and her boyfriend in Halloween 2018 went to the dance dressed as the killer duo. But I'm not buying that Allison would go from just trying to live my life, get a promotion at work, and be there for my grandmother to let's just burn Haddonfield to the fucking ground and piss all over it within a few days of meeting Corey. Also, sitting on the same side of the table with the person you came to eat with when no one else is sitting at the table. I don't care if you're dating or even married, it's fucking weird. Cut to 28 seconds of emo bike riding and I would like Halloween to end right now. Can we make that happen? Can we roll the credits? I've got a doctor's note. Can I come in? Another night. Oh, f*** you, Corey. What have you got better to do? Another visit to the Michael Myers tunnel? Oh, I guess that's exactly what you had to do, but f***ing why? God damn this movie. Hey! You know, f*** Doug Mulaney! Doug Mulaney is possibly the most ridiculous murder fodder ever written for this franchise. He trumps Tina's boyfriend Mike from part five, Alice the unfortunate next door babysitter in the first part two, and of course, Halloween 4's Bucky, the technician that was just trying to keep the Haddonfield power plant running. Poor Bucky. I guess Corey just knows for a fact that Michael won't kill him the second time he walks into the tunnel and also somehow communicates to Michael that another victim would be in shortly and he could have at him. And that fucking worked? What? Corey, I'm pretty sure Michael didn't tag you in. There are rules to tag team combat, Corey. Rules! Show me how to do it. <laughs> also, I'm kind of disappointed we haven't seen Corey out here in the sewer getting lessons like Uma Thurman and Kill Bill. So this is a darkly lit scene and the subtitles say Michael's breathing shakily, which you can barely hear under the fucking classic Halloween theme. And while I love that theme, it would be nice to actually see and hear Michael's battle with old age and health issues, rather than being covered up with darkness in the movie score. Also, it would not be nice to actually see and hear Michael's battle with old age and health issues. Who the f*** wants to see that? Going along with the movie's theme, it would have been natural to reveal Corey as a new surprise Michael by the end of it all. In the absence of Michael, someone took his place. Imagine most of the same stuff in this movie happening, but with a lot more slasher deaths, people who just happen to have connections to Corey and later Allison. The audience thinks Michael's back, because why not? Then you drop the Corey reveal on him, and then we as CinemaSins would send the f*** 
fuck out of that movie. Also, also, the homeless guy from earlier was saying that Michael takes bodies in the tunnels sometimes, which means he's been killing other people for the past four years. So why isn't he already back to full strength? And where are these bodies that's been piling up in the tunnel? Is he f***ing eating his victims now? Also times three. I guess the more Michael stabs, the more life comes to him? Is this like Dracula, only blood gets spilt on the floor instead of coursing through Dracula's veins? Is Corey his Renfield? How did Michael know Corey was going to Lori's house? Or that he was seeing Allison? Or that Allison and Lori live together? Has Michael been stalking them for the last four years and just choosing not to attack? I no longer understand anything. I'm starting to miss the simplicity of the white horses metaphor in Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. I'm missing the goddamn white horses Halloween end. See what you've done? Can Lori seriously not see Michael walking away? She's looking directly at where he was less than two seconds after he left. Imagine if your grandmother had fallen in love with Michael Myers. Imagine having a friend or co-worker turning your traumatic past into shitty anecdotes for her own amusement. F***ing nurse Deb. See the way people avoided him or how they made faces behind his back, which if I'm honest, pissed me off. Cause I felt like they took my pain, my despair, and they made it about them. This is a great line. Now imagine this in a good movie. Unfortunately, they sandwiched this great moment in with some second rate Badlands and a Michael Myers that is completely inconsistent with how he's been for the last two films in this trilogy. I always appreciate the big swings, but just because you make a big swing doesn't mean you always connect. And he looks at me and it's not him. At least not in the eyes. What a f***ing massive mistake these people are making by simply reading into what Corey's eyes look like. I mean, sure, they're right. This isn't anything you can actually determine just by feeling it. They're making the mistake that Lori warned about while writing her memoirs, and I don't think the movie is going to take them to task for it. Did the town do this to him after the accident? Or was it always there? Don't know. Gotta leave now without saying anything. So ends my internal monologue. Mind if I... Bedroom's down the hall. Clean up, take a shower. Is she not already cleaned up? Was she wearing the dress under her scrubs at work today? Dr. Mathis? Corey is stabbing Dr. Mathis in the background as Nurse Deb walks out, and maybe Dr. Mathis has reached a point where he can't scream anymore, but stabbing someone isn't exactly silent, especially from that distance. Failing at the attempt to be like Mike, the actual Michael Myers comes out of nowhere in a bad cleanup. I don't know how they communicated this arrangement, but yay! Slashin's back! Please don't do the head tilt. Please don't do the head tilt. Damn it! She teased the man with brain damage and then he snapped. Seriously, I want to know how this story became the prominent narrative surrounding Michael's escape that was made possible by the doctor in the 2018 movie. And is anybody going to blame Tommy Doyle now that he's dead and can't call up a posse to come after anyone who dares bring it up? I can smell her on you. Mothers who smell their grown children. Allison? Lori walked into this house where Corey is sleeping and thought, what's the most random annoying way possible I can wake this kid up? Did Lori know about the paper plane's significance on the night Corey was babysitting Jeremy? Because based on this evidence, she must. And it's super f***ed up that she's doing this. She knows something's up with Corey, but she doesn't know he's a full-on murderer yet. Feels like she's poking the bear a bit here when she doesn't need to. You secretly hope Michael comes back for you. That's actually why the majority of us are watching this movie, but we're an hour and 13 minutes in, so I guess we all lose? I'm the psycho. You're the freak show. How the f*** did Lori get up from this chair, which is leaning against the wall, and disappear without a sound? It's here where I imagine an alternate universe where Corey looks up sooner than he does, and catches Lori quietly getting off the chair and tiptoeing to the next room, but comically stopping mid-tiptoe when she's caught. That's right. Meanwhile, back at the hospital where Allison works, nobody seems to care that a primary doctor and the recently promoted nurse were brutally murdered or turned up missing in the last day or two. Also, we have Allison's ex dead, her boss dead, and her co-worker who got promoted over her dead or missing, and absolutely no one seems to be concerned about it. You got something I need. That something Corey needs is Michael's mask. Now, in the last four years, the legend of Michael Myers should be known nationwide. How many people died in the last two movies all in one day and night? That mask would be sold like the ghost face mask at this point. Corey doesn't need to steal Michael's. Unless the podcaster was f***ing right about the mask in that first movie. Please don't tell me the podcaster was f***ing right in that first movie. What are you gonna do now? Probably randomly showing up at Lori's house again at the exact moment Corey is there and put the mask back on so we get a random fight with Lori for a few minutes and then a death by industrial grinder. It will have a striking score and a kumbaya moment that is both cheesy and insulting along with the town showing up with their metaphorical pitchforks. You will feel like something big and grand has happened but you will know in your heart that it is not. It's kind of amazing that Corey decided to become a serial killer like Michael Myers and on that very day the bullies went to the exact same gas station from earlier in the movie so that it could do the equivalent of rhyming couplets. Also, once upon a time, Corey f***ed up these bullies' beer run. Now he's snapped and f***ed up Billy's LeBaron. Confession, it's actually Terry's LeBaron, but that f***s everything up, so I gave the car to his friend, and actually, it's probably not a LeBaron, but Terry calls it a little baron, and that f***s even more up, but I'm not going back. See the same thing in him? 
that I saw in Michael. Michael. It's weird Louie wouldn't start with Corey telling her if he couldn't have Allison, no one would when confronting her granddaughter. Maybe that wouldn't work either, but it probably has a lot more of a chance than the comparing him to Michael Myers nonsense. Because of the hysteria that you caused when I trusted you, my friends are dead. Where is this coming from? If the movies are trying to paint a picture that Laurie is even partly to blame for Michael's rampage, it failed. In the first movie, Laurie warned people that Michael could come back, but she did not taunt him or any such f***ing thing. But that podcaster dude sure did. And in Halloween Kills, she was in a hospital bed nearly the whole time, even unconscious for lots of it. In Halloween, Allison was in the police car when she saw Dr. Sartain kill a cop, pretended to be Michael, and expressed regret that people wanted to kill him. Maybe Allison is just lashing out and she doesn't mean it, but this is yet another chance for me to ask, why does Dr. Sartain get absolved of all the blame? If you show the underrated gem hard target at any time in a movie, I should remove a sin, so I think I'll add two instead. Plus, he's watching it on his laptop. F*** this guy. Wait, what are you trying to do, man? Suck your own- Give me a f***ing break. Since when does Corey have the kind of stealth where he can stab someone in the face in a nearby car and no one hears a f***ing thing? One minor aspect of this movie that I've enjoyed so far is that Corey isn't good at Michael Myersing yet. And now, after a couple days, he's suddenly amazing at it. There's so many possibilities to run and hide in this dump, but Margot and Stacy decide to just stay in the tow truck's path and run straight. They too are graduates of the Prometheus School of Running Away From Things. Oh my god! Oh I understand the need to help your friend, but you do know that someone drove that truck over her a minute ago and is still in said truck, correct? This is not a Christine situation here, but even if it was, stay a fucking way! Motherfucker went through all that trouble to get Michael's mask and now he's just standing there holding it like he's Andrew Garfield in The Amazing Spider-Man. I got you, you psycho! I do not expect Terry to be smart, and I don't expect Corey's mom's boyfriend to be smart, but this scene is just too fucking dumb. And there goes impossibly vanishing Corey again. Margo! How the f*** is Margo still alive? A chain link fence would not protect her from tow truck tires driving over her. Stacy's dead. You're dead too. She says this instead of, Terry, look out, or Terry, behind you, or Terry, I've always hated you. See you in hell, dick. Songs for the resurrection. No thanks. I saw that Halloween movie back in 2002 and I'm in no mood for songs about it. People reading Hustler or really any magazine in 2022. Can I help you? You had Diana Prince, AKA Darcy, the male girl, and we don't get to see her till an hour and 23 minutes into the movie? For shame, Halloween ends, for shame. I'm glad the movie finally got to all the killing, but I'm now beginning to wonder where Corey got all the strength all of a sudden. Are they really saying a mask stolen out of a hardware store in 1978 has mystical strength properties? Is this the point where the movie is saying the podcaster was fucking right? Allison has Lori stored in her phone by her name rather than grandma. Did you really think I'd kill myself? Well, no, not really. But I'm not sure why you went through the trouble of making it look like you killed yourself unless it was just for the audience to go, oh no! It does virtually nothing for the situation. I don't know how the element of surprise helps you here, especially when you waste the initial shock on a one-liner. This f***ing muffler that shouldn't even be rattling anymore since Allison brought it to the shop to get it fixed is still f***ing rattling and becoming Halloween End's own personal Wilhelm scream. I feel like this would actually be pretty easy for Lori to explain, especially with the way Corey is dressed and the Michael Myers mask being at the scene. Not to mention that Allison will soon find out about the other murders that Corey committed. It's not really the gotcha moment that the movie seems to think it is. <laughs> I guess Lori didn't die a hero and live long enough to be the villain. You! You! It's wild to me that whenever a door is left open, Lori always assumes it's Michael Myers and she's almost always right. Does he seriously not know how to shut a door so his presence isn't automatically known? God damn it! Michael's just been hiding out this whole time? How? And huh? And how? What I think I find irritating about this final battle of the trilogy is the fact that it being Halloween is so arbitrary to the preceding hour and 32 minutes. It's like those random mentions of it actually being Friday the 13th in a Friday the 13th film. At this point, who the f cares? Allison, where's Lori? We're responding to a call. She called in a suicide. And Lori told you the exact address and everything. Why the f are you calling Allison to ask where Lori is? And how are the police not already at Lori's house? How f***ing big could Haddonfield possibly be? Hmm, if a five alarm blaze in my kill basement didn't work in the first movie, that must mean that a fire extinguisher will work. Lori's attempt to go full irreversible on Michael Myers doesn't work, but I really don't know what the plan was here. She very calmly and confidently walked into the kitchen, started cooking a microwave dinner, and went into a closet actually thinking a fire extinguisher was going to get her out of this. Whenever Michael or Corey step on someone's face or neck, they crush it immediately. What makes Lori's neck that much stronger than the rest of Haddonfield? Is she doing neck exercises every morning in case this happens? When you think the wells run dry on callbacks, the movie gods bless us with a sewing needle. Or, I think that's how the expression goes.
But either way, it's bullshit. <laughs> so it looks like they need to start calling Michael Myers, Michael Myers. See what this movie's done to me. I love how the final battle between Laurie and Michael is not much more exciting than a throwaway WWE Tuesday night fight. Also, movie goes full Halloween H2O on the Laurie versus Michael battle at the end. I'm halfway surprised she doesn't drive him to the side of the road and hit him with a shovel. Do it. Do it! Do what? Go back and do a Rocky Four style montage of past Halloween hits? How the f did Allison get here before the cops did? Where the hell's Frank? He's at home washing his tights. This is not how it works. It is tonight. This motherfucker has no goddamn clue what has happened up to this point, but he is on board immediately. I'm not saying Michael Myers doesn't deserve all this and more, but could you maybe ask a few questions before the town industrial grinding is approved? Traffic. This place is an active crime scene from earlier in the night, but sure, let's also make it where hundreds of people stomp all over it to watch the death of Michael Myers. Like, can't find some other crushing machine around town. Besides, the mask is the power, not the man. I think. I honestly don't know anymore. Also, did they just pass all the dead bodies at the front of the dump from earlier tonight? Were they just like, yeah, those bodies probably need attention, but let's make sure we take care of throwing a corpse in an industrial grinder first. It's amazing how you keep thinking you've seen the most ludicrous thing in this movie, and then the Michael Myers crowd surfing scene comes right in the last couple of minutes and asks you to hold its butcher knife. What an incredible story of survival through decades of disturbances in our local community. Once again, people talk about Michael Myers' decades of disturbance, but this is simply not the case in this particular series of films. Michael had a 40-year period where he was in an institution. He wasn't doing a Halloween 2 through Halloween resurrection amount of killing or disturbances. I've said goodbye to my boogeyman, but the truth is evil doesn't die. Man, Laurie took just enough time to write this self-help memoir for Michael to die, become a national sensation again, and tremendously boost the sales of a book that had basically no chance to sell much before all this happened. Enjoy. Gifting vegetables. What was it you were saying about those cherry blossoms? Was it Skip? I think it was Skip. I hope it was Skip. I just liked Halloween Ends so much, I'm starting to like Halloween Kills, and I don't even know how to begin forgiving you for that Halloween Ends. Why won't you die? I told everybody! Nobody listened. We didn't listen! We, we didn't listen! In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the... Anyone? Anyone? The Great Depression. He got hungry. Man wouldn't do that. Tis no man. Tis a remorseless, eaten machine. I met this... Six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and... Lifeless eyes. Black eyes, like a doll's eyes. Tommy! How's the peeping? Tommy? How's the peeping? You're serious about it, aren't you? I am serious, and don't call me Shirley. Costain wrote that fate was somehow related only to religion, whereas Samuel... You locked yourself in. Oh, and you're a regular Rhodes Scholar. Where, where was it you graduated from again? Hmm? The University of Duh. Oh, I am scared! I shot him six times! I shot him six times! He's a liar! Here, just, just, just put it up there real gently. Janet. I have one thing to say, and that's damn it, Janet. Everybody goes back out. We just close it up. I want to sweep from Chestnut south to the bypass. What I want out of each and every one of you is a hard target search of every gas station, residence, warehouse, farmhouse, hen house, outhouse, or dog house. Putting you down and keeping you down until Gans is locked up or dead. Haddonfield is a pretty quiet town before tonight. Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit smoking. I can't find anybody. Bud's gone. Mrs. Alves is gone. I think we gotta use Death Blossom. No! Kelly Clarkson! How's it hanging, Phil? But on my way, I'm gonna be doing this. If you get hit, it's your own fault. He was no dragon. Fire cannot kill a dragon. F***ing Windows 98! Just call me. Call and call. If you feel like you've called too many times, call once more. Don't take drugs! Ha -ha! 
wait for the police. These officers, God bless them. They remind me of my days when I had to run from the police. E molto pericoloso, signorina. Speak it, speak it! I'm not who you think I am. What do you think I am? Human? Hey, Ted, where the hell's Parks grow? Hello! If I can change, and you can change. Dear God, make me a bird so I can fly far, far, far away from here. These eyes do not see. Behind these eyes, one finds only blackness. You need not take it any further, sir. You proved to me that all this ultra-violence and killing is wrong. Wrong and terribly wrong. The fingers you have used to dial are too fast. To obtain a special dialing wand, please smash the keypad with your palm now. Say something, Michael. Say it. Say you like my hat. Here's Johnny! Back in your houses now! A plague on both your houses! I don't want them to gain another yard. You blitz all night! Hawkins and I'll track Market Street up to Lampkin. I'm going to Lampkin! You are the ones who are the ball lickers. It rubs the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again. Don't you know whose house this was? You don't any idea who you're stealing from? You and your friends are dead! I got this knife. That's not a knife. That's a knife. We're not that drunk! We're not, not that drunk! drunk. When you're a little kid, you're a little bit of everything. What do you think? This is like, this is the ugliest car I've ever seen in my life. It looks great on you. I'm sure it does, but I'm not going. Carpe diem, okay? You looked hot in it. Every pregnancy is different. Every pregnancy is unique, right? Your vagina is not the same as room 207. This guy <laughs> up the LeBaron. Yeah. Dollar store designer frame. Oh. <laughs> so f***ing hot at the office today. You had me at hello. You had me at hello. They say if you lie between two of the main wires, your body just evaporates. You become a gas. I don't want them to gain another yard. You blitz all night! 